I want to welcome everyone. As I'm out of breath, uh, climbing, <laughs> running up the steps to get here for the January 12th, 2022 Charles County Board of Education general meeting. This meeting is now called to order. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first order of business, I will ask Mrs. Schwartz to come up and give us some guidance. We have to elect a new chair and new vice chair. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. This is uh, an annual event that we have our election uh, and we're looking for the election of the chairperson and vice chairperson of the board. Um, the election will start with the election of the chairperson of the board and I will call for nominations, and nominations do require a second. Board members can nominate themselves, but can only nominate one person. Uh, we'll I hope we can only nominate one person. Ooh, that's fun. I will call for nominations for chairperson. Ms. Brown? I nominate Tina Wilson. Nominations require a second. Is there a second? Second that. Are there any other nominations? I would like to, can you guys hear me? Yes. I would like to nominate Mike Lucas. I'll second that. Okay. Are there any other nominations? I'll declare nominations to be closed. We will now have a chance for each of the nominees to give a three minute uh, presentation on why they should be elected. I will start in the order of nominations with Ms. Wilson. Uh, thank you. And thank you uh, to everyone that uh, my fellow board members and to the members of the pub public. It is an honor, an absolute honor to serve as a board member. Uh, I am, I've had the privilege of uh, going through attending Charles County Public Schools um, I went off to college. Um, I've served my country for 20 years and I've traveled the world. Because of the education that I received in Charles County Public Schools, it set me up for success of being a good uh, civilian, a good military officer, a good contributor to society. When I returned home to Charles County, it was never my intentions um, to run for public office. But I quickly realized, because I, we all value education. And so I ran for school board, never, ever with the intentions of either being a vice chair or a chair. Quite honestly, I didn't know what that responsibility entailed. But regardless of how you serve, regardless of what degree of commitment you give to being a board member, I know that when you are the chair, you have to lead by example and you have to model the behavior that is expected for those that you serve with and for. And for that reason, if you uh, uh, surely all of you have realized that the last year and not by choice by luck and by blessing perhaps that i served as chair as the most challenging times in in the school board's history and no matter what you decide today i will continue to serve in whatever capacity you choose for me to do because we are a board and it doesn't matter quite frankly who is the chair or the vice chair as much as how we work together towards promoting and sustaining an excellent school system it has been 
an honor and a privilege to serve in that capacity. If I should garner your vote, I will continue to work towards bringing us and keeping us together and to continuing to promote um, education. And I have enjoyed the opportunity immensely and um, ask for your vote. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, it is indeed an honor to serve in any public office, and, and I've been blessed um, to be serving now my third term on the Board of Education. And uh, I appreciate the, the work and the dedication of my fellow board members. Um, the, the role of the chair is to set the agenda, to run the meeting, and, and to express the will of the board. And those are things that uh, I would like to do in a leadership role and I think uh, can be done in a more expeditious fashion. No one has been a stronger supporter of public schools than myself. Um, I've tirelessly worked, as other board members have, um, to support budgets and programs that will give opportunities to children, to all children um, of this great county. Um, I served on several committees in MABE, the Legislative Committee, and also uh, a committee for blueprint implementation. And I think that's vitally important um, during this time as we're looking at transformational changes in public education. Uh, I reached out to all of you. Um, when we talk about collaboration, I, I let you know my intention because I think that's important. And I would very much appreciate your support today um, as we work together to lead Charles County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I will now uh, call for a vote. Uh, we will uh, vote in the order of nominations. Five votes are needed for election. Uh, all those in favor of Ms. Wilson for position of chairperson, please raise your hand. And Ms. Battle Lockhart will need some uh, verbal uh, agreement with from you so it's miss wilson miss brown mr hancock all those in favor of mr lucas as chair please raise your hand it's mr lucas um, miss, I... <laughs> mr lucas miss abel oh, mr hurd i don't see a raise hand here I, I didn't hear what she said she's yes, or no. yes. Um, neither candidate received five votes, uh, so we'll have to uh, re-vote. So again, we'll vote in the order of the nominations and continue until we receive five votes. Um, Ms. All those in favor of Ms. Wilson, please raise your hand. Ms. Wilson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Hancock. All those in favor of Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas, yeah. Ms. Abel, Ms. Mr. Hurd, and Ms. Battle Lockhart. So again, we do not have five votes. Uh, we'll continue until we receive uh, five votes for any member. Uh, at any time, uh, the chair can uh, recognize any other motion made by the board. If at any point any board member wants to start the process over with new nominations, we can do that as well. Uh, without any motion being made, I'll call for Votes for Ms. Wilson as chair. All in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Wilson and Ms. Brown. All in favor of Mr. Lucas as chair. Mr. Lucas, yes. Ms. Abel, Mr. Hancock, Mr. Hurd, and that's Battle, Ms. Battle Alcart. That was in favor? That's a yes, yes. And that's five votes for Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas, congratulations as new chairperson of the board. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, fellow board members. Uh, we will now repeat the same process for position of vice chair. Uh, we will call for nominations. Any nominations for position for vice chair? Mr. Hancock? I'd like to nominate uh, Tina Wilson for vice chair. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? I'll close the nominations. Ms. Wilson, you're given three minutes if you'd like uh, for any uh, statement. I will not uh, uh, make it a three-minute uh, present, uh, presentation, but uh, like I've stated before, 
in any capacity to serve the Charles County Board of Education is a privilege and honor and in whatever capacity that I am asked to do, I will serve it to the best of my abilities. Uh, and thank you for your vote of confidence. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. I will now call for a vote for a position of vice chairperson. All in favor of Ms. Wilson as vice chairperson, please raise your hand. It's Mr. Lucas, Ms. Abel, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Hancock, Mr. Hurd. Yes. And Ms. Bedelockhart, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilson, congratulations as vice chairperson. Uh, I will then now defer back to the new chairperson to call for a break in the board so we can reconvene, uh, reconvene with the new seating. Sure. So we'll take just a quick uh, five minute break to rearrange the seats. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will resume with uh, our board meeting. I'd like to congratulate Vice Chair Wilson. Thank you again, fellow board members. Um, at this time, we'll have an update from the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Good afternoon, Board Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, uh, board members, and staff. Today, I bring to you several Charles County Public Schools operational updates for your information. But first, I want to thank all Charles County Public School teachers and administrators, as well as parents and staff, for adjusting quickly to a virtual learning schedule last week. Uh, a special shout out to our building service team for making all of our buildings accessible, and to food service staff for ensuring that our students had access to meals. Last week, we had a shortened week due to two snow events, one much larger than the other. And I want to take this opportunity to remind the public about our inclement weather operation procedures. When forecasts call for bad weather, staff work with the county and state roads departments, the National Weather Service, and local and state police to monitor both inclement weather threats and road conditions. Uh, conditions. There are many times when inclement weather decisions such as a school delay or closure can be made the night before and there are times when staff need to monitor inclement weather in real time to make the best decision for the community when possible decisions are made the night before bad weather is forecasted but there will still be times when we follow our standard protocols of announcing schedule changes by 5 a.m inclement weather procedures as well as the many avenues the community can use to learn about whether delays or closures are outlined in page 10 of the parent handbook calendar regarding COVID, i have received numerous inquiries regarding uh, con uh, inquiries concerned that the school system will not communicate contact tracing and, co and quarantine information to our families especially now that we have our district dashboard on our website Please note that is not the case. Anytime a decision is made to quarantine a classroom, grade level, or school, the school system will communicate directly with the affected parents and staff of said school community. Note we work closely with the health department to make these decisions. As we continue in-person instruction, I want to remind families to keep sick children home from school, and we ask the same of our staff. Yesterday, the health department opened Regency Furniture Stadium in Waldorf as a daily COVID-19 test, uh, COVID test site. I hope the availability of this new site provides additional resources for our families and staff to be tested if they're, ex if they're exposed to a positive COVID-19 person or are showing possible symptoms. And a reminder that our staff and students can sign up for weekly testing in all of our schools and offices. We have also implemented temporary measures to eliminate unnecessary traffic or visitors to our schools. This includes a temporary suspension of spectator access in January to include athletic and extracurricular activities. Other than staff working these events, no other visitors will be allowed to attend January events. Some fine art events may be live streamed on YouTube or recorded for sharing purposes. CCPS streams some high school athletic events, those primarily held in the gym or in the football field, using a service available online through the NFHS network. We will reevaluate future spectator access later this month and will implement an online ticketing system to manage visitor traffic to athletic events. We have also asked 
um, principals to postpone any out of county academic field trips for January. Due to last week's snowstorm, we have moved the end of the second marking period. Um, we are scheduled to move this, the end of the second marking period from January 19th to January 26th. The third marking period is scheduled tentatively to begin on Thursday, January 27th, with additionally Friday, January 28th, be a two hour um, early dismissal day for students to provide teachers with additional time for grading. The school system um, shared these changes and we'll bring them forward to the board today for a discussion on new items for final approval. As we move from the second to third marking periods, we're starting our extended learning and tutoring programs for students, including homework help, virtual tutoring, and in-person tutoring at our schools. Some of these offerings will be available before or during school, but also after school hours when students are home and have free time to connect. At the secondary level, schools may also be offering additional opportunities for credit and grade recovery, ACT and SAT review, college prep workshops, and Saturday learning opportunities to support students' well-being. Parents, please be on the lookout for information specific to your child's school regarding tutoring, homework help, and other extended learning and support programs. We will also be returning to the board with more information regarding our expanded summer programs for students at a later date. Another update I want to share with you today are changes coming to the school system's organizational chart. These changes will go live, will go into effect July 1st of the, of the school year, that is 2022, and include the alignment of superintendents, cabinet leaders from deputy and assistant superintendents to chiefs of their various departments. There's also an addition of a chief of schools position and a director of community engagement and equity, as well as a few reporting changes to better align departments under the new leadership structure. Um, school administrators received a copy of the updated chart earlier today. Later on uh, in today's agenda, Assistant Superintendent of Fiscal Services, Karen Acton, will present the fiscal year 2023 proposed operating budget. The budget request is just under $436 million and includes an increase of $27.8 million over this year's based operating budget. The request includes direct measures to ensure employee compensation efforts are fully supported. One of our main goals is to address support staff wage shortages identified by a job classification survey conducted last year, as well as, as to provide competitive teacher salaries. As you are all familiar, the blueprint for Maryland's future legislation requires the school system to offer a minimum starting salary for teachers of $60,000 by 2024. The budget request includes measures to move CCPS towards the blueprint requirement for teacher salaries. Additionally, the budget request also includes funding for an early college enrollment program with the College of Southern Maryland that you will hear about shortly as well as additional asks to support student well-being. I also want to note that this budget also shows a realignment of existing resources in the tune of nearly $1.9 million. Ms. Acton's presentation will go into further details on all of the FY23 budget requests. Finally, and I'm really excited for this last paragraph, um, so we round out today's meeting with student and staff recognition. Today we will honor students and staff from William, William A. Diggs and J.P. Ryan Elementary Schools, General Smallwood Middle School, and Thomas Stone High School. We will also recognize seven Charles County public school teachers who were chosen by the Maryland State Department of Education as assessment for learning classroom of distinction. These teachers will open their classrooms to be observed by other educators from around the state and participate in conferences with them while informally serving as mentors. Teachers earn the state recognition by infusing the formative assessment process in instruction to improve teaching and learning in the classroom. I am excited that seven out of seven teachers that earned this distinction all came from our school system this year. Mm -hmm. So this is a big to-do. Um, as always, 
I appreciate the ongoing support of teachers, staff, administrators, students, parents, and community members. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro. Now we'll have uh, correspondence from board members. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas, and um, I'd like to congratulate you as well as Vice Chairman uh, Wilson on um, your leadership roles. Um, we know that you'll do a great job. I um, just want to say Happy New Year to everyone. Um, hopefully everyone had a good holiday season. It's good to see everyone again. Don't really have a whole lot to talk about right now, but I um, am going to talk. With, ask the superintendent to talk a little bit more about um, as what she spoke a little bit on the procedures for um, how to close schools and, and exactly how that's made. I know a lot of us heard a lot of feedback from the community on Wednesday um, with, uh, with the decisions for schools. And I was surprised as well as someone who lives in the rural area. I can say the roads were like, there was a lot of trees down on, uh, on the back road that I live off of. And, um, and there's a lot of people in the community without electricity, um, which I think compounded the problem. When you're virtual learning, um, I feel that the, a lot of those people's biggest concerns were just trying to stay stay warm and, and focus on keeping their family safe. Um, so I would appreciate it if you don't mind if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, how the decision is made and who all makes that decision. And uh, thank you for we had talked previously about doing this, and I want to thank you, Dr. Navarro, for for always being so open and, and willing to explain that process. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Um, so as I mentioned, actually, um, starting from the beginning, the board actually has a policy. It's uh, code 3772 that designates the superintendent um, to uh, make the calls regarding opening and closing of schools and any emergency closures. Um, I want to say that, um, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, staff really came through our building operations once again. Um, Frankly, um, this building was cleared on Tuesday afternoon um, because we needed to do payroll. And so Ms. Acton uh, was in a panic trying to figure <laughs> out how to do that. And I was in a panic when I realized she was on a panic. <laughs> and our building service team here clued it up and they were staff from central office that actually came in and did payroll and payroll came out really well. Nobody noticed anything, which was great. Um, you know, one of the things that I am, uh, I, I've gotten quite a bit of messages, I too, have learned what it's like to cut trees to get out of your house and melt snow to flush toilets. I have learned that lesson now and will never make that mistake again. Um, and I really got an opportunity to visit parts of the county that infrastructurally, clearly, as, as, as I heard this during the summer months, um, it really hit me as I actually went out there um, with Mike and drove through some very treacherous areas of the county that um, take a lot longer, I think, to, to be cleared. On Wednesday, um, our decision to open, uh, knowing that there were still some parts of the county that had treacherous um, uh, road, uh, um, comes as thinking through the entirety of the, of the school system. We had, um, I believe we had an attendance rate in the mid 80, 80% um, on Wednesday and subsequently, um, well, 80, 84% on Wednesday um, for students who were online. Um, that doesn't negate that there's absolutely sections of our community that were not quite ready there. One of the things I instructed the um, principals to do was to post assignments and to leave those assignments actually into this week and give flexibility to students. The decision to come in um, came after we reviewed uh, with Mike Himes' office uh, the majority of the situation with the county roads. We looked at um, how transportation was happening, obviously the clearing of our buildings. We did have to divert uh, some staff because of a power outage to other buildings or because there was a road that, to a school, to Gale Bailey Elementary, that was difficult to, to maneuver to another site. Um, what I want to say to the, to the board also is that one of the things that I am going to look into and review um, is the um, option of 
whether or not um, some school districts in other places in Maryland have sections where they open the entire school system but then may not open a portion of their schools because of where they're geographically located. I, um, I think we need to look into that option and have a very clear plan that we work with those communities where we think that may happen about what that would look like. And so what I ask is that I have the opportunity to come back and maybe um, uh, give a plan of what those options could look like that get added into our inclement weather um, opportunity. There was also some questions about why opening one hour um, versus a two hour delay. Uh, and the reason for that is that students were already delayed for two hours. So if we opened with more than two than an hour delayed, it would not have counted as a student as a student day. Um, and I think there were some other questions later on about when we make the call. Sometimes um, we had a, a, one of those days, I can't even remember exactly which one, where we had the uh, warning of ice. Uh, rain in the morning and that warning uh, was actually lifted for Charles County because it didn't actually materialize itself overnight so we decided to make the call to wait and see if it materialized by 4:30 in the morning I am now waking up at 4:30 every day I realized that three days four days in a row changes your sleep pattern where now I'm expecting a call at 4.30. But sometimes we make those calls and, and I just want to assure the public that we are thinking about both staff safety and student safety and um, as we make these decisions. But I welcome the feedback and um, the criticisms, the um, just overall as, as we move forward and look at what other options we can think about when we are faced with these conditions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. It's, it's never an easy decision. And, and for many of those kids, you know, some of those kids would have had the opportunity to come back uh, had they, since they didn't have internet access. But of course, the roads made that, made that very difficult for some of them. So um, appreciate the opportunity to hear further discussion about what you just said about being able to close sections in particular schools. Thank you. Thanks. Any more correspondence from board members? Mr. Brown. Thing. I'll just uh, very quickly. Sorry. 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 Ms. Abel. Um, just uh, some correspondence that I received um, regarding uh, bus service and transportation this morning. It seems seemed like a local social media site had more information than the public did and i don't know how that transpired but there was a list of buses that were delayed and running late that was posted on a social media site and then it wasn't posted on hours until two hours later so i just wanted to make sure that we knew what was going on and see if there was a problem with buses again <laughs> this morning <laughs> So, Mr. Snow, is Director of Transportation, he actually tweets out that information and is posted on the transportation webpage. Okay. So, if we're in order for anyone to have that information, they would have seen that information. And I can't, you know, say where that particular source. But the only way for someone to get the, all that information that was put out there would have been through the transportation office. So that, as soon as the transportation office made aware, either through uh, the bus contractor or another bus calling in to say that such and such bus isn't making its run, or bus five is covering bus five and bus eighty two. That information is posted on the transportation webpage, and again, Mr. Uh, Snow tweets out that information. So I would encourage the public uh, to follow uh, the transportation webpage, and that information has been put out there all along while we've uh, endured these driver shortage issues, as we've been referring the public to the transportation webpage. So, you know, since we are still in the middle of a driver shortage, plus that's being uh, coupled with the fact that just like with you know, with our general population and the higher COVID uh, positivity rates, that's also affecting uh, some of our bus drivers as well. So uh, we have, uh, in, they in particular, have seen a higher number of buses with either two buses, you know, being covered by one or a bus particularly not running at all. But again, uh, we ref you know, would please encourage the, the public to refer to the transportation webpage as part of the school system webpage for that latest information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Hancock. Yep. And actually, I had a question for you, Mr. Heim. Um, so <laughs> sorry, and you can probably answer from right there. So real. Quick. <laughs> so today's shortage, not was that more so to do with COVID as opposed to bus contract stuff that we've dealt with in the past? So we still do have a few contractors that do not have all their routes covered due to the driver shortage. But today's issue uh, was, I think, made worse by the fact that, you know, whether it be COVID or just, you know, someone being sick in general. Uh, but that was the reason either COVID or a sickness for the higher numbers today. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Wait for me to sit down in case yeah, you have a yeah, question. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <Ms>. <laughs> <Abel>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did have one other correspondence that I wanted to relay, and it was in, relard, in regards to COVID testing and athletics. Um, over the past couple of weeks, I guess there was a shortage of testing, and in order for athlete, athletes to compete or participate, they need to test negative, and tests weren't available. So that was waived and people were participating anyway. And I just want to make sure that the rules are the rules and we're not just waiving them for our benefit or when are arbitrarily. I, I, I was looking, I, I didn't see another spot on the agenda to ask this. So I apologize. And it came in as a correspondence to me. No, so, so just so I'm understanding, uh, Ms. Abel, um, so what you're saying you're hearing is that um, with some of our sports programs that there seemed to have not been enough testing and so there was someone who said the students were permitted to participate even though they hadn't been tested? Correct. Evidently there wasn't enough test available and students couldn't prove a negative COVID test so they were allowed to participate anyway. Okay. That's, is um, this the first you're hearing? <laughs> it, 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 yes. It is. Okay. So we're, thinking, we're hearing it. And just as a reminder, so now we're back to weekly testing for all athletes, regardless of vaccination status because of the conditions right. that we're in. Um, right before we went on break, we uh, made sure that everybody tested, but we also put a pause on, especially when we closed the high schools, we put a pause on those events and so forth. Um, we'll look into that. We... Um, um, and see what that looks like. There was a lot of schools, especially high schools, uh, where students um, wanted to test the very first day back, meaning yesterday. So I know that there were some line issues because everybody wanted to test back. Um, but we'll, we'll double check on that because what we want is for athletics specifically for kids to get back into that regimen of weekly testing so that they can continue. And as you heard, we're cocooning them again a little bit so they can compete, but taking spectators out at least for the month um, to, to keep them going. But you're right, we don't, wanna, we don't want um, students who haven't tested on their weekly schedules to be practicing together until they do so. So thank okay. you for bringing that forward. Thank you. We're going to wait to see if there's any <laughs> other correspondence. That's, that was it for me, sorry. Oh, well, the only thing I would add to that is that if there is um, a specific place you want to share offline at some point, then I can just sort of check it out. Um, I would be glad to do that. Thank you. you. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Any other correspondence? Going once. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Mr. Heil, President of the Education Association of Charles County. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lucas, Board of Ed, Dr. Navarro, and distinguished guests. It's been an interesting couple of weeks, uh, so much so that this is the third draft of what my comments look like, the, the latest draft coming this morning, so I will make sure it gets sent and is able to be posted on board docs. Um, there is so, uh, up to and including that I had to change Chairperson Wilson to Chairperson Lucas on this. Uh, there's so much to report and highlight, it's hard to believe that it's only been two weeks since we were scheduled to return from winter break. First, the good news. When it was announced on break the system was going virtual, there were several concerns raised by members. The chief concern was time needed to shift planned lessons to virtual and still have the lessons be meaningful. In working with the ACC, CCPS leadership was able to address the planning time concerns we brought to their attention. After emails and conversations, a good compromise was worked out to give staff adequate planning time to meet the challenges of a week of virtual learning. 
As everyone is well aware and has already been addressed, Mother Nature had other plans for last week. The Board of Education leadership made the right call with Monday and Tuesday with significant power outage, outages, trees down on roads, and other dangerous road conditions. I do, however, need to address Wednesday. Wednesday, the decision was made to come back with over 5,000 people in the county without power and more employees outside the county without power and the necessity of closing four buildings due to these conditions. To be clear, it is within the purview of leadership to make that call to bring in staff. But should they have? I'm reminded of a poetry lesson I once did, and I asked my department chair if I should let kids bring in songs that had cursing in it. This was in my early days of teaching. <laughs> um, his advice still resonates with me. He asked, what did I hope to gain and what might I lose with that decision? I was reminded of this last week because those two questions showed up in my head. What did we hope to gain? Saving a snow day, giving staff the opportunity to plan for the week and touching base with students. What was lost? Morale, security for some employees, added pressure on staff in an already maximum pressurized year Staff added pressure in changing the routines and all that that entails because they were being sent to other buildings if their building was closed. If you lived in your school's district, you potentially were leaving a house with no power to come to work or take a precious sick day in this pandemic era we all continue to try and navigate. On Wednesday, most of the main roads were decent and the occasional tree down to make drivers have to go into oncoming lanes. However, a lot of development roads, a lot of the non-main roads, a lot of the dirt roads were not. If your area was fine, you were probably fine but there was a significant part of the county that was suffering for three days at that point. What did you have to lose? An opportunity to increase morale, the potential to make some staff feel safe and secure as they work through these county issues, and a pocket of pressure that leadership could have alleviated. That is the toll of Wednesday. This leaves us with the current state of COVID and school policies. Almost all staff would like to return to in-person and not virtual learning if it can be done safely. COVID numbers of infected in this county are slightly over 37% today. The Board of Education leadership issued its newest plan yesterday to try and accommodate the ever-changing balance between navigating the current pandemic era with vaccines and boosters available and getting students the best education they can under these challenging times. The Board of Education leadership moved to the end of the quarter to allow students and teachers to have their grades accurately reflect the learning taking place for the second quarter. EACC has been asking for more time to allow for planning, grading, and professional responsibilities. BOE leadership responded and added three additional two-hour early dismissals with one in January, February, and March. This is evidence of the compromises that can be made when we listen to each other and strive to create better working conditions. Please remember, educators' working conditions are student learning conditions. But along with that time came another policy the school system has to adapt. Parents can keep their children home out of realistic concerns for the exposure to COVID. The student will, quote, participate in synchronous virtual classes, close quote, to keep up with the class. If students are to keep up with the classes, this implies the teacher will be teaching hybrid again, maintaining their classes in person while they address the needs of students on the computer as well. This may sound simple to the outside world, but there's a drastic impact on the class in this scenario. Teachers have to keep track of two distinct groups. Teachers have to create things for in-person and online students. This means that all assignments have to be made available in-person and online. Not all in-person assignments easily transfer to online and make that work effectively. To make that work effectively, teachers need time and resources to complete that transfer. Although we are thankful for the addition of three two-hour early dismissal days, the latest instruction to staff regarding making lessons accessible for students who are not in-person takes us back to demands of providing both in-person and virtual learning. Frankly, that doubles the workload in a year where staff are already drowning in the number of tasks that are being added, while nothing has been removed from their plate. My growing concern is we're making these decisions with the best of intentions for students and parents, but are not fully considering all the implications for the staff that need to implement these considerations. This meeting is a perfect example of the contradiction in policies. I checked this morning and these meetings are still limited to five in-person speakers. I would ask you to consider the classroom teacher in a class over 30 if they could also have that ability to limit their room capacity. While we were virtual, it was commonly said that it takes about three times the amount of prep time for a virtual lesson than an in-person lesson. Yet now we want teachers to return providing instructional materials for both in-person and virtual learning. If these issues are not addressed, I'll leave you with the words of wisdom from my great English and department chair. What do you hope to gain and what might you lose? Are the gains worth the impact of the losses, especially the losses that still impact staff morale 
and retention at a time when we can ill afford to lose just one educator. EACC would like to continue to work with CCPS leadership to increase the gains, limit the losses, and address the myriad of workload issues that face educators. We can't afford to compound the losses and the educator shortages we are experiencing. Thank you for your time. From the American Federation of State and County Municipal Employees. Congratulations, Mr. Lucas and Ms. Wilson. Good afternoon. I am Sarah Birch, president of Ask Me Local 2981. I hope everyone enjoyed the holidays. It sure was good to be at work two days in a row now. The snow sure slowed down progress, and no electricity stops progress completely. On that note, I think now is the time to recognize the building service workers. When I pulled into the parking lot on January 5th, it was amazing. Not only were the sidewalks completely clean, so was the whole parking lot. There are times when we as employees don't realize not only does building service keep the schools clean and safe for children and staff, but all of the outside is maintained by them. Mike Kine and April Murphy are the supervisors that head up this group. Good job. Ask Me Local 2981's next monthly meeting will be Tuesday, February 1st at 4.30 and will be virtual. Notices will be sent to members. The negotiation committee will be meeting in January, gearing up for our first negotiation meeting on February 2nd. This is a change from what's on the board docs because it got changed yesterday. It is important to remember how fast COVID-19 spreads. Wear your mask and vaccinate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Excuse me, Mr. Lucas. Um, could we please get the EACC update posted on board docs for the public? It's not on there. Thank you. I was because of all the revisions I was unable to present that you, you'll be getting that sent as soon as we wrap up here. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sable. Now we have Dr. Navarro and joining us today also is Dr. Murphy, who is the president of the College of Southern Maryland. So we are here, I want to present the team that is before you. Um, to my left is um, the president of the College of Southern Maryland, Dr. Murphy, I think you all know her. Um, and next to her is uh, Dr. Redmond. Uh, Dr. Redmond and I actually know each other from uh, our days together in Montgomery County. So when I saw him here, I almost couldn't believe it that he was here. And so kudos to being here. And I'm so glad that you're here today. And, um, and with Kevin Lowndes, we are the team that's coming to you to present uh, an update on a um, very exciting opportunity for our students. Um, here in Charles County, and it is about the early college program partnership with the College of Southern Maryland. Click. Oh, I have the clicker. Sorry. Um, so uh, one of the things I just wanted to make connections um, for the board is, as you all know, the Maryland Blueprint uh, really requires school systems um, to have a solid base in how they're thinking about their experiences for students for college and career readiness. And if I dare say, in a way, uh, what we're seeing is an evolution of what high school is all about, and it'll have implications into middle school and elementary schools. 
Um, but it is extremely important that uh, counties be thinking through um, solid partnerships that really create pathways for students that are meaningful as they um, leave the K-12 school settings and continue on to either the workforce and um, or education and that that continues uh, that that continuation is maximized by the opportunities in the school system before they leave and so I wanted to just remind you about the Maryland blueprint mandate and how we should be thinking about having these programs in place I think the school system uh, in previous years had a lot of options for students to take dual enrollment with the College of Southern Maryland and that's wonderful but uh, we believe Dr. Murphy and I believe and this team believes that really having solid pathways is really the way to go um, and really opening uh, and maximizing opportunities before even our students leave us um, from the high school environment. So with that I'm going to pass it to Dr. Murphy to talk a little bit about um, our joint venture and then the rest of the team to talk through the details. Well thank you we're honored to be here today it's, it's great to talk about this partnership I've got to say this partnership is very, very important to the College of Southern Maryland. And we see this as an important strategy to help those students for whom college is not a reality in their lives. This is something that will connect kids who haven't really been thinking about college with the possibilities of what they can actually do in a seamless pathway. I've always said my entire life that the community college is social justice through <clears throat> education. And we know through a lot of data, and Dr. Navarro and I have had tons of conversations about this, that the early college experience, not just a dual enrollment class, but the early college experience is a game changer for low income underrepresented students and it changes the trajectory of their lives and the lives of their entire families. I cannot tell you how excited we are at the College of Southern Maryland to enter into this partnership. It is going to change the lives of many students, their entire families, and indeed it's just going to really enrich our community. So we are really happy to be here at this table. But I think we need to give credit to those folks who did the nuts and bolts work. Yes, not you and I, right? <laughs> no, no, we didn't do it. <laughs> We're the idea people. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, it, and it helps to have support from the idea people. Yeah. <laughs> that, that matters a tremendous amount. Here's the clicker. Uh, thank you. Um, so with the, the program that we're starting with, with and, and I want to stress the word that we're starting with, um, because um, as Dr. Navarro mentioned in her opening comments, she and I have some experience together when we, from our time in Montgomery County. And we both believe, we both know from experience uh, what a game changer this can be for our students and that this is only the start of a conversation about providing multiple paths for students based on what their interests are. And the program we're starting with is our General Studies Transfer Certificate Program. It's a program that we've developed at the college that's about a 31 uh, credit program. Students can, are taking general education courses, which means those courses will transfer to any of our four-year partners, as well as to other two-year colleges, should the students choose not to stay at the College of Southern Maryland. Now, of course, it is our desire to have them stay at the College of Southern Maryland and complete an associate's degree. But we also understand that students have freedom of choice. Um, so we, we designed the program that would allow them to take general education courses that they could then transfer to other institutions we're starting the cohort with 150 students from a pilot uh, bunch of, of uh, Charles County schools. And uh, my friend uh, Kevin will talk about the pilot schools in just a moment. But we're starting with uh, 150 students to start. And these students will be on the La Plata campus uh, for, to take their classes. Their faculty will be the faculty from the, La Plata, from the College of Southern Maryland who teach our regular college credit courses they will actually start their day and, and pretty much end their day on the La Plata campus. Um, and so they'll have access to all of the same support systems, to the tutoring centers, to the libraries, to all of the supports that any other College of Southern Maryland student would have access to. These students will have that same access 
to those same high quality faculty and high quality support systems. And the, I, the intent here is to, do, to offer this to students at very little to no cost to them, uh, so, which is really a game changer. When you're talking about students who don't necessarily see college as a part of their career, one of the reasons sometimes is because you're looking at the cost of what that might look like. Thank you, Dr. Redmond. First of all, I would like to start off by thanking Dr. Redmond and his team at College of Southern Maryland. I mean, it was a great, great effort between our team here at uh, Charles County Public Schools and the, the team at uh, College of Southern Maryland coming together. And we, we all had a great idea of what we wanted, and we kind of batted around ideas and, and what, what was already working with our dual enrollment program. Because one thing that, you know, this county already has is a strong dual enrollment program. And so, uh, it was very easy to get this done, and it was uh, very helpful for me to be able to see uh, the College of Southern Maryland and all the things that they have to offer for our students when they go there. So thank you very much, Dr. Redmond. Uh, in looking at the, the schools, we knew we had to start with a pilot number of schools because there were going to be some, some glitches along the way that we're going to have to really fit, work out. But the intent is really to open this up eventually to all our, our, all our high schools in Charles County Public Schools. Uh, the reasons why we picked these schools, we looked at the other schools, uh, you know, uh, North Point and McDonough have countywide programs, and when we looked at La Plata, it already has by far the most students participating in the dual enrollment program at the College of Southern Maryland. So, you know, we, we looked at the schools, and these schools didn't have either one of those, and so this is why we chose Lackey, Thomas Stone, Westlake, and uh, St. Charles. And so we're going to start out with these four schools. We're going to work on the glitches next year, but the intent really is to open up to all our schools uh, and all our students in Charles County uh, Public Schools. Whoops. Did you want to talk about the pilot? So we, we want, as part of our conversation, we had to think about, it, you know, we're trying to make, narrow this down and to get a good start. And so who are our target population? Who are our target students? For this particular program, we really decided that we wanted to target the students who are currently 11th graders who will be rising seniors next year. Uh, because this will literally set them, the, their very next year, they'll be going to college someplace. Uh, it is our hope that they would be going to college someplace. So this would really align with what they're already doing. Um, and we, we talked about, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the courses that we, are, we proposed, but we also talked about identifying those students, as Dr. Murphy mentioned, students who may not necessarily see college as an option, but that doesn't mean that they can't do college. Just because they don't see college as an option, many times, and, and I would, if we took a poll, I would bet dollar for dollar that each one of us could think of at least one student who didn't see college as an option, went to college and blossomed because somebody gave them an opportunity. Somebody told them how to do college. And that's what this program is about, is providing an opportunity and helping those students to understand how to be a college student. And it provides that opportunity while they're still in high school. So, they, so that really, it really advantages their high school experience or leverages their high school experience. We're talking about students who definitely have the potential, but may not simply have the opportunity. Students who are underrepresented um, or underserved populations. Our, our low income students quite often don't see college as an, as an option. Many of our, our, many of our minority students don't see college as an opportunity. Many of our immigrant populations don't necessarily see college as an opportunity. But those students can go to college and be very highly successful. So when we looked at the admission and enrollment process, the one thing uh, that we know is that sometimes this process gets in the way of students actually going to college because they can't get through the process itself. So we wanted to make sure that the process was easy and something that our, our staff already is a, a, you know, understands and is, is well and familiar with and can help guide our students when they're going through the process. And so we are going to use the same application as our dual enrollment, but we are going to call it uh, and create a separate early college application that's going to be similar to our dual enrollment application. So our students and our counselors will be familiar to what the requirements are and to how to fill out that application. Um, we are going to ask them to write a 250 word essay, just ex kind of explaining why they would like to go into this program. I mean, we have to remember that these students, uh, while they are enrolled in Charles County Public Schools, will be going to school at the College of Southern Maryland. They'll be sending their classes there. Uh, they'll be going to 
uh, get help and support on their own there, and we won't have the oversight per se that we would if they were in our own high schools. And so we wanna make sure that students that choose to go into this program really want to go and have an understanding of what that program is. And so that's you know the intent of that 250 words. It's not to limit anyone, but it's just to make sure that folks that wanna go and choose understand you know, that this is something that they want to do. Um, and so we were going to go out with the College of Southern Maryland. We'll be doing some parent nights um, and explaining to the parents at these uh, four high schools what this program is and the intent and um, help guide them through the application process to make sure that we're getting as many kids as we can to apply for this program for next year. We're on a tight timeline because, uh, you know, as we know, our students are going to be soon looking at the courses that they want to take next year. And this would be a program there where they would go to the College of Southern Maryland for their senior year. And so we want them to understand exactly what it entails um, and how it would operate. Rodney. And so if we look at, um, as you may know, uh, we at the College of Southern Maryland have implemented an accelerated course schedule. And so what that really means is that students get to focus more intently on one or two courses at a time rather than trying to take uh, four or five courses in the, in the span of a semester. So we've broken them down into essentially a, you know, a, a spring one, a spring two term. So it's still a 15 week semester. They will ultimately will still take the same number of classes, but they don't have to focus on all those classes at, at the same time. So they get to devote their time to just that one or two subjects at a time. And that we have found to be very successful, especially for incoming students, especially for students from underrepresented populations, especially for students who've not been to college before, who don't have parents or, or other family members who can talk to them about how to be a college student. So those kinds of strategies really help those students to be successful. Here we're kind of showing the, a breakdown of what the student day would look like. Um, they would essentially take about three classes a, a term, and those classes would be classes that are approved by the Charles County uh, Public Schools, our partners in Charles County Public Schools, to make certain that those courses actually meet the graduation requirements, because we don't want to have students taking classes for which they cannot use towards graduation. They, we want them to be able to use the classes in two ways, to get the transfer certificate, but to also meet their graduation requirements. So what we did was we met with our folks upstairs in the curriculum office, met with the College of Southern Maryland deans of their content areas to look at what are great courses for our students to take next year, but also what also matches up with our MSDE standards that, to make sure that the courses would require, I mean, uh, satisfy those requirements as well. And so and, and working together, we've come up with this list of courses that we're able to offer. And one of the reasons, the, another reason why we chose these courses is that we wanted to make sure that every single one of these courses would transfer into the University of Maryland system. We didn't want our, take our students to go to College of Southern Maryland and take a course that wouldn't transfer the next year. And so the 31 credit uh, program is designed to have the 31 credits transfer to a University of Maryland college system. Um, and, and, and also meet the high school requirements that they need in order to get their high school diploma. So what will happen is, is that they'll take these courses, their transcripted courses, but they'll also get on their high school transcript, uh, like a math class, math 11, or math 12 class, which will meet their senior year math class uh, on their transcript. The transportation. So we still are obligated to provide transportation for these students. They are still high school students. And so the idea is that they would go to their high school uh, in the morning. Our buses would pick them up and take them to school. The other thing that allows us to do is it allows us to feed them breakfast if they uh, receive free and reduced meals and before they go and give them a bag lunch uh, to take to the, to the college to make sure that they both have a breakfast and a lunch just like they would if they attended a high school. We are obligated to do that as a system as part of this program. So um, our transportation would be Charles County Public Schools school buses for students that choose to do so. Some of our students might choose to get there on their own, uh, which would be fine as well. Um, so we do have to provide transportation for the students that need it, but students that can get there on their own will be able to do so. 
But actually, the transportation is one of the reasons why we designed the schedule the way we did for that first class, allowing for the buses to get there, but also ending at the time at College of Southern Maryland that allow us to transport our students back to the high schools to be able to get them home. The other thing this program will allow them to do is participate in sports and extracurricular activities at the schools. Do you want to talk about that? And then as we look, as we, Dr. Navarro alluded to earlier, and Dr. Murphy alluded to, we believe that this is really the start of an early college program uh, but, and a partnership between the College of Southern Maryland and Charles County Public Schools. We envision that, that as the years roll, we'll, each year we'll, we'll meet to roll out a, a different program. Um, we've had some great conversations uh, as we're trying to, planning to roll out this program about what we might be thinking about next. So some of the, we have some wonderful AA programs. Some of our STEM programs are absolutely wonderful. And, and being in this particular region, where we've got the Patuxent uh, Naval Facility available to us, we have a number of grants and research opportunities where our students, our faculty, uh, participate in, the, in research in the various STEM areas and in engineering. So we can certainly connect those students with those opportunities. Those are excellent undergraduate research opportunities. Uh, our students, we have the best, absolute best engineering program, uh, bar none in the state. Um, our robotics team is nationally known, and they are internationally international, <laughs> international winners of uh, robotics competitions every year. Um, so there are a number of opportunities there. So the students would be engaged in programs that would not only heighten their interest and a love of learning, but set them very good on a path to transfer to any four-year school would be absolutely pleased to have our students come to them uh, to continue their undergraduate education and beyond. Um, we also are looking at some of our CTE programs as well and trying to figure out how do we align our CTE programs in such a way that students who are currently in Charles County Public Schools who want to pursue that option as a career path. So it's not just the students who are pursuing academic paths, but students who want to pursue career paths can also have the opportunity to further their education and to further their credentials within their prospective careers. Now the one thing that we do have to take into consideration, which we'll be working right after we get this program going, the 31 credits, is that for the AA program to begin, it's going to have to start in the junior year. And so we're going to have to back map that to the freshman and sophomore year to make sure that they're getting the credits that they need to be able to participate in that this program by the time they're juniors. So we do have some work to do that we're going to start working on right away once we get this 31 credit program up and running. At this time, we'd love to take questions or hear your thoughts about what we presented today. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I could do it administratively, uh, Mrs. Battle Lockhart, are you still with us? Oh, thank you. Yes, I am. You know I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> but, thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, if, if I may, I, I will tell you I'm very excited about this program. Um, one, it, it, it's, uh, it's new, it's refreshing, and for those students that need a bigger challenge, this just you know, kicks the barn doors wide open. It, it would be useful, I think, if you could show how much of a cost savings in terms of marketing to parents to say, hey, we look how much money, or even to the students out there that may be independent, look how much money you are saving. The second aspect I'm very interested, and I know this is at the very beginning of the program, is I like the idea of you uh, focusing on the underrepresented and underserved. And that's gonna present a lot of challenges, particularly with African American, uh, never going to college, um, the, ch the challenges that we've always had in taking higher maths, higher languages, et cetera. And I'm hoping that there would be perhaps a tie-in with Abbott program to kind of get that exp exposure. You mentioned partner colleges. Is it a long list? Could you regurgitate very quickly? Well, I, I can tell you, um, sure. We. We are a transfer-heavy institution. Um, 
are most of our students and this is a matter of circumstances, go to the University of Maryland Global Campus. But right after that is College Park. Uh, we are among the 16 community colleges in Maryland. We're their number two transfer partner after Montgomery. So a lot of our students do participate in programs at College Park. Towson and Bowie are other strong transfer partners. We have a lot of students who, who transfer there. I will say most of our students stay in state. We have very good relationships with Salisbury and Frostburg, um, UMES. Uh, however, we do have students who go out of state. The, we have probably 100 different articulations. This program right here fits in any of them, mm -hmm. which is nice. And I, I would add that with our school system having a pharmacy tech program, that, that, that there's a huge potential to uh, to, to get dual enrollment, and particularly those career fields like in the health services. And obviously, <coughs> um, uh, as a UMES uh, graduate, we have a pharmacy <coughs> program, and, and, and that would be a great partnership. Um, and I asked the question about your partner colleges, because if we can get this program up and ro rolling and get them to understand that the other colleges that are out there, I'm thinking, you know, financial aid, building those relationships. And so I think a, a way to advocate that and to get this really up oh, and wow. going is the cost. Look, look at the cost savings because a lot of, of our young people are going to college with all of this debt. And this will, mm -hmm. you know, serve a great, a great uh, need. So thank you. That, I look forward. Ms. Wilson, just for your information, we are one of the few colleges that has a partnership with UMES in pharmacy, and it goes through the Doctorate of Pharmacology. Woohoo! So we're we're really proud of that. One. <coughs> and I'm I, and I'm sure that there are others, but it's a good example of how from high school all the way to you to, until you graduate with a four-year degree or higher, that there's huge potential in collaboration. Thank you. Mr. Hancock. I would like to comment, oh. please. Oh. Do you want to? Okay. Can you wait? Yep. Next. All right. Ms. Battle Lockhart, please. Go ahead. All right. Well, um, Dr. Navarre, you know I'm excited, right? I know. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry that you're not here. I wanted to present to you as well. So. <laughs> I know. So as a... Um, <clears throat> A uh, dual enrollment educator, I'm excited um, to see Charles County moving in that direction. Um, as a product of community college, I'm excited to see um, CSM growing um, themselves in this direction as well. Um, and um, with Ms. Wilson speaking on um, savings, the beauty of this, not only um, savings as it relates to the school, is now that we partner with those industries, such as I did, I was working for Marriott myself, and they had tuition reimbursement. So there's no um, student loans for me. So that's one of the biggest things that I, I like to continue to champion when, we, when I go before the public is that you get to understand these employers and what they have to offer along with what this, the colleges are doing with these dual enrollment programs, and you you know, you don't have any uh, bills to pay. <laughs> you can actually just start your um, career and put your money in your pocket or in the places where um, you want to go and grow. So um, I'm looking forward to um, more than just a conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing this come to fruition um, for the sake of the students um, because I come from the underserved population, but anybody can benefit from the program. But um um, I'm so excited, it's, and it's great to be able to have a conversation with your superintendent about your aspirations for the school system and see it come to fruition. So I look forward to being a part of the journey um, in the future, and I, um, I hopefully love to see hospitality on the <laughs> as one of the programs because, you know, that's where my heart and soul lies. But thank you all for the presentation, and I'm looking forward to, what, to see what the future holds. Thank you very much, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Thank you for the presentation. That was that was awesome. You know, it's if you think about this, 
Um, this could be one of the most impactful things that that we do together. Um, when you look at uh, uh, providing the opportunity for someone to extend their education where they might otherwise not be able to. That's pretty powerful, and it's, it's cool to be a part of this. When you look at a lot of the stuff in Kerwin, budget-wise, it gets kind of scary, but you look at something like this, and you say, well, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty neat. So thank you for the presentation. I have a couple of questions. Um, the, the first question would be, um, I know that initially it's going to be a pilot program, um, and it doesn't include all the schools, but we still do have some underserved students in the other three high schools at La Plata High School and McDonough and even at North Point. Um, will there be any opportunities to assist the students at those schools as well? So we still are going to offer the dual enrollment program. So students that are participating in those schools, you know, they'll still have the opportunity to take uh, College Southern Maryland courses um, and get the courses. And then, like I said, where the, the goal is to extend this to all seven high schools uh, in the in the very near future. It's just it takes some time to get the glitches out of the way where we might have, you know, bus problems. We might have boot problems. We might have problems that, with some of our students understanding what it means to behave on a college that we, we you know, uh, Dr. Redmond and I have to figure out, like, what kind of supports we might have to put into place uh, where we have maybe something going on that, that makes sure that we, uh, our students understand that they're, they're no longer considered a high school student when they're at the College of Southern Maryland. They're considered a, a college student and they're considered you know, to understand what that means and, and how to behave as such. And so uh, it, it takes sometimes a, a few uh, trials and errors to, to get exactly what we need in place. And, and that's why we're starting with 150 students rather than three or 400 students. And our goal is to really build this as, as big as we can and help benefit as many students as we can but you know, if we tried to do that in the beginning and then it turned into a disaster, unfortunately, you get off on the wrong foot uh, and you're not able to quickly adjust. And so that's why it's, we, we're trying to smaller with fewer high schools to make sure that we get, we get off on a good, good start and that we can improve whatever we have and to begin with. Thank, thank you, and I just, I think it's such a, it's, it's such a good thing that, and, and I know everything takes time, but the, the sooner we can provide everyone an equal opportunity, um, regardless of the school you go to. I think the better it's going to be for everyone. And it's a lot, I think it's, this is going to be a life changing thing. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. One last real quick question. I may be jumping the gun here a little bit because I know the budget is coming up next. Um, but since this is under Kerwin, we are, and I'm just, so I'm asking the question, we, we are required to do this, whether we get the funding or not, correct? Is, um, Yes, and, and, and I think we can talk a little bit about it when we take a look at the, the budget request. There is in legislation an, an amount that is, um, that is going to be appropriated per um, student. I will tell you right now that in a, um, in a call with the state on Friday, uh, with the state superintendent, one of the things we pointed out is that allocation is not enough. So that allocation, I believe, was $514, $17. I don't have my exact numbers per student for the college and career readiness pathway. Not, you know, there could be a couple of different options for that. Um, that's not nearly um, the cost of, 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 the, of these kinds of programs. Um, and, and we need to be thinking about these programs with the connection of the um, the per pupil allocation that we get and what that means for how we staff and, and, and what that means in our schools as well. Sure, and, and I know again, and thank you, Dr. Navarro, and, only, and I know we haven't even talked about the budget yet, but this is such a good example why we need, why this budget is so important that we're going to discuss. And uh, for people that make the decision on, on how much of our budget gets funded, I want them to see this because this, this is, you know, we do so many things that can be debated whether, you know, people have opinions on different things, whether it's necessary in public education. To me, this is, a, is extremely important. It's the very end, it's preparing students. So many, and I grew up in the era of, if you didn't have the money for college, you didn't go to college. And a lot of those kids, and I'm one of them, we went to the trades and we made a lot of, it was good for us, we made good money, but there's some kids that just don't have those options. And I'm, I came through that generation. And this is life-changing, not only for the students, but it's life-changing for our community and for our future. And I just, 
want the decision makers to see this is the kind of stuff that changes lives and it's in a good way. And I would say, Mr. Hancock, you're pointing out a really important message here that this is, um, this is an investment in the economic development of this county. It is. Um, we are, if, if we follow through with the pharma, um, pharmacy pathway um, or any of the health cares, you are seeing a county that is uh, able to produce workforce ready people much earlier than in traditional or non-traditional ways. If we let students who are, um, who cannot access higher ed because of financial issues or whatever the reasons are, they've been traditionally underrepresented populations, females, whatever it is that, that, that we have. Um, if they can't access the workforce meaningfully and contribute meaningfully and deal with openings that we have right now in the county, that doesn't benefit the entire county. So this is absolutely, and I'm glad you brought that up, a workforce development. Uh, we're acting as a catalyst to expedite the opportunities and the kind of workforce that we're putting out for the, for the entire community. Um, and I will say, um, and I just want um, students to hear this, um, you know, uh, when Dr. Redman and I um, so worked together, he was at Montgomery College earlier and we started this program, there was a lot of nervousness about behavior of kids in college. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yes. It, doesn't it, doesn't it, doesn't it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So I just want our young students to know that this superintendent is very clear that you all step up and you guys act in a, in, in a great way to represent, and I can't imagine there's any difference in Montgomery County with Charles County students and how you will represent us on a college campus. We just did not see that, and I do not expect to see that. Now, how it's appropriate de uh, developmentally for a student to be able to have that level, that's what we're gonna be working on and mm -hmm. seeing the appropriateness of not just academic, but you know, developmentally um, having enough experience of being on your own and how to manage yourself and so forth. Those are things that we will uh, figure out that first year, um, but there is, you know, there's no doubt that this team feels the constant pressure of Dr. Murphy and I saying, so what's next? Uh, <laughs> and so um, we're just very excited about that, exactly what you said, and the economic development is, is bullseye in terms of the, of, the, of the benefit to the entire county. Thank you, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great thing and a great uh, presentation, thank you. Oh, Ms. Brown? This, thank you for the presentation. This is going to be great for our school system. I am glad that you are starting out small, so that you can make sure that you have it right. So when we open it up, we don't have any glitches. We have it down pat. So I am happy for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And Ms. Battle Lockhart, you had one more thing to say? Yes, I had a question. Um, for whoever at the, on the panel. Um, the one thing I just wanted to share, my experience with the students um, that I teach, and I ho I'm hoping um, that you all will take the advantage, take advantage of the opportunity if you, <clears throat> on your journey of um, implementing into this process is options. Are we getting the feedback from the students of what type of programs that they're interested in going into because the challenges that I, that I face is um, some of the schools are offering specific programs and the kids are just kind of settling for what they have versus really getting into the thing that they want to get into. And I know there's going to be opportunities where you can't offer everything, but at least get the input from the students. Because for me, as an educator that's teaching my industry to students, um, and some of the students that are in the classroom are just in there just to be in there, it's is very um, concerning for me. So I just want to make sure that I put that out there that um, if we're support, um, making sure that we are utilizing and talking to the students to ensure that we are trying our best to get as, um, what the best variety or options that they're truly interested in. Uh, we agree at the College of Southern mm -hmm. Maryland and one of the things that's built into this program is the first year seminar course which has a career exploration and charting your path forward piece mm -hmm. in it. So we know that students often don't really know what they want to do because they haven't had very wide exposure. This is something that gives them a sense of what the possibilities are. So we, we take that to heart. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Mr. Hurd? Thank you for this presentation. And, you know, on behalf of the students, we really are thankful for the work that you're doing. I've been very envious of other counties for a while now where their students walk across the stage to get their diploma, but they also walk across the stage and get that degree. And I think uh, that's what Charles County is aiming for. And I think this represents you know, the evolution of a once very rural county. And I'm really excited for the future of what this has to offer. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty because I know it sounds like you guys are working on the big picture ideas. Uh, but two things I was just interested in preliminarily. Uh, first was the breakdown of student life. So is the expectation that these students would be involved in extracurriculars at their respective high schools or are they also going to have opportunities like you said to be involved in an international world-class robotics program you know where do we draw that line for our high school students and then secondly if this is fulfilling graduation requirements uh, how are we calculating the GPA and the rank of those students uh, because we don't want students and this happens sometimes where we have a great program but they can't get past that number and what it's going to do to their GPA. And I know we're, we're aiming for underserved populations, but I don't want this to be just another reason why they're not in the top 10 of their class because they deserve to be if they put in that work. So thank you. Uh, I can answer the ranking one. You can go okay. ahead and answer the other one. Go so, <laughs> so students will be able to participate, one, in the extracurricular activities at their school. Um, Sometimes, depending on what the student interest may be, there sometimes are, in terms of, for instance, with athletics, there are some high school graduation requirements in order to be able to participate in um, junior college athletics that, that we have to answer to um, the athletic association for. So, so they may not be necessarily be able to be a member of our baseball team, but that doesn't stop them from being a member of some of our other clubs at, at the school. So they will have those opportunities, especially if those are academic-based clubs and organizations, such as our robotics team. If they're, if they're taking the engineering courses, they're interested in robotics, they are certainly eligible to be a part of those, those kinds of opportunities. That's awesome. So the, the ranking, we are looking at the advanced placement uh, designation for these courses. It, it, it's an interesting, so we're going to have a committee look at it. It's interesting because un unlike the high school courses where you take seven courses, uh, you know, at the college, it's in the quarter system. So you can take double as many courses as you can as if you, than if you were in high school. So we have to look at that as well and try to look at the whole picture before we come up with some set rules. And so that's where we are in the process with an understanding that it, is an it should be advanced. How, are, how do we balance it between... It, the overall picture of a student in, in a school and in a student that goes to the college for the full year and is able to take double the amount of courses they would than as a student who re remains in their high school. Um, it's an interesting dilemma for us to work on and we're, we're looking forward to it, so. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll just add, you know, I'm a, I'm a Marylander and uh, I'm a College Park grad. I bleed Terrapin Red, but I spent three years at a community college. And that was for me, um, as Mr. Hancock alluded to, um, you know, kind of my only option at the time. Um, you know, single mom and welfare and food stamps and the whole nine yards. But not only would, did the cost help, but, but the opportunity to figure out, you know, what it is you might want to do. And now you're starting even earlier. Um, I mean, 18 and 19, right? You, you might think you might know what you want to do, but you can explore these options. And just as a side note, when I started at the University of Maryland, tuition was $666, because I'll never forget that, <laughs> a semester, 12 credits or more. So you can imagine it's just a tad more than that now. Um, and, and cost, you know, is, is a real thing for a lot of people. So, and it, you know, as my board members have said, this is fantastic. And Dr. Navarro, you used the, the exactly the correct word. This is an investment. This is not an expenditure. Uh, this is an investment in our county. And um, 
Dr. Rudman, you mentioned Navair. They're good folks, but we also have Naval Surface Warfare Center Indian Head in our backyard. And, and my, <laughs> for, my former employee across the bridge in Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren. And, and I've seen the resumes when I was working of people that were at CSM, and then they, they went to Maryland and hired a couple. And they're great, great people. So I look forward to this very much. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh Miss Acton and her So now we'll hear from Ms. Acton, and this is the, uh, the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 operating budget. So now the fun begins, yeah. right? Yeah. Everyone's been anxiously yeah. waiting. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, joining me is, is Sherry Fisher Davis, our budget manager. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to present an overview um, and that's going to start with the second um, document that's attached, the report item. And I'm going to go over the budget planning model. And then Sherry is going to lead us through the PowerPoint in a little more detail. So starting on page six on the revenue section, um, we are asking the county for additional funding of 19.5 million, which is an increase of 9.9%. There's a $58,000 decrease in miscellaneous revenue, which is attributable to our vending contract. Excuse me, can we uh -huh. just get that on the screen at the same time? What you're referring to, is that? We didn't put that one out there because we oh. were gonna just do the PowerPoint on there, sorry. Okay. I thought that you could pull it up from board docs. Okay. I mean, we have it, but for the public to see it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I guess we should have done that, but. Those same numbers will be. Yes, she's going to show you the exact same numbers. Okay, thank you. So mine are um, a little more confusing anyway, so that's why we thought the PowerPoint would be better for the public. Um, so we have a decrease of 58000 which is from our vending contract. When we renewed a contract, it went from Coke to Pepsi. Um, our usage was, was down, so the contract is not as uh, lucrative as what we had had. And we're, we are estimating, and it is an unofficial estimate from the state, of an increase of $8.4 million, which is a 4.2% increase in state funding. We don't have the official numbers from the state. Um, we, with fingers crossed and maybe a lot of prayers, we hope to have it before our budget work session, but um, we're not clear on when we're gonna get those exact numbers. So our, our total revenue increase is 27.8 million. We started with a base revenue budget of 408 million. So our total budget request is 435 million, almost 436 million, which is a 6.8% increase. So on the next page, on page seven, we talk about um, the increases to our budget. On the expense side, we are asking for a 7% increase on health care costs, which is almost $3 million. We have not asked for a health care um, cost increase in, in two fiscal years, but as we project out this year, we definitely think that we will need that. Uh, we have a 6% increase on bus contracts, which is 1.9 million, which is the pay scale recalibration. That number does include a reduction of 423,000, which is the cost reduction associated with five routes of pulling those um, in-house. We're estimating we need a 15% increase for our MABE liability insurance and workers' comp premium, which is 570,000. 
and a 13% increase on our nurses contract of 488701 And the final mandatory cost increase is the COLA increase for AFSME, which we gave in the, um, the fall for 4%, which is attributable to our MAG compensa compensation study. That's $2 million one. So the total mandatory cost increases is $8 million. We are reserving $16.3 million for collective bargaining, which is for both AFSME and EACC. That does include a reduction of $2.4 million, where we've budgeted at 99%, and it also is inclusive of about $4 million that's um, attributable to the blueprint. On the other budget changes, the blueprint implementation cost increases that we're showing is Title I staff pre-kindergarten conversion. We will have to absorb 10 FTEs, which is 775-112. We are asking for a pre-kindergarten specialist of one, 126,250, an English language learner specialist of 127,000, and then below that, you see the, uh, the early college program that was just discussed and the cost associated with that. Um, the I'm sorry, um, Mr. Chair, is it okay to ask a question before you get too far down the list, or okay. do you want to take questions That's at the end? Right. Let her get through the whole thing, please, and then okay. we can ask okay. at the end. <laughs> and this is on board docs, if, if the public would like Yep, it's follow. the second document on there, and it's page six and seven. Um, the annual tuition cost that we're estimating for 150 students is 427,125. The instruction supplies, uh, 240,629, and transportation is 27,000. We are also expanding our virtual program. We would like to, which will encompass four teachers, one computer analyst, and one counselor. So that's six increases, which is 640,000 and also um, an increase on our APEX, which is for the AP courses, 186,000. In order to bring in the five buses, the bus routes that we would like to bring in, three buses are estimated at 330,000 and two buses at 250, which is 580,000. We need two bus attendants and five bus drivers, one mechanic, um, 71,000 for the bus attendants, 225 for the, for the bus drivers and 85,250 for the mechanic. We also are re in that in the bus the transportation budget we are reallocating at, at, um, 596,000 to offset some of those costs which is an existing tra transportation budget line item that we had in there for additional bus purchases. And then the last category of, of changes is the non-instruction and instruction budget increases. The chief of schools, the additional person that Dr. Navarro talked about in her org chart that she's adding, 248,750. Technology budget, which is to sustain growth, repair, and aging equipment of 750,000. And also an additional 180,000 that's needed for Microsoft Premier Services. We are asking for $20,000 for the Office of Communications for closed captioning, $50,000 for the Office of School Safety and Security to, for increased background checks, a, an additional $10,000 for office, office of School Safety and Security, which is for office supplies, additional $50,000 for the Office of School Safety and Security, which is um, has to do with the increase in hardware maintenance needed for the radios and 1250 for the Office of Human Resources to expand the EAP services. The instructional budget increases that we're asking for, um, we've got 68000 in for illustrial, Ill illustrative math, student resources, 19000 for six to eight consumable student kits for illustrative math and algebra one 64,500 my path 192 675 IXL 23 483 dream box 175 I won't read that whole list um, <laughs> but to offset 
um, so those items there we are trying to put into the budget as line items where the, in the past they've been paid out of end of year funds and to offset a great portion of that we are eliminating 26.4 positions um, through attrition of 1,875,000. The one thing that I should mention though is that we are asking for 4.5 therapeutic behavioral support counselors in there. So the additional FTA, FTEs when you net it out is actually 5.2. And we have um, other budget reduction, the one time non-recurring from uh, North Point of 247,264, 90,000 for the staff mental health, and then the 58,000 for the vending commissions, which brings us to the, the total budget request, 435,966,435, and additional FTEs, as I mentioned, of 5.2. Any questions on this part before we go to the to the PowerPoint? Uh, Ms. Wilson. The Title I staff uh, conversion, you said we're, we have to absorb that. Could you elaborate a little more on that? Yes, as part of the, um, the blueprint, in order to avoid, avoid supplanting, we have to absorb those FTEs into the operating budget instead of it being part of Title I because of the funding that's coming from the blueprint. Okay. We, so in order to avoid supplanting, in essence, if it's federal funds, the system can't do the same thing that Title I is doing. They have to do above and beyond. So we we're getting to the point where we we're on the same level. So we had to absorb those 10 FTEs so that Title I funding could continue to be above and beyond the operating budget. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Any other board members? Um, I think Ms. Bella Lockhart had a question. Did she? Hold on. <laughs> she texted me, said she. Nope, she's good. Okay. She's okay. She's okay as long as my phone holds out. Um, the school buses, these are buses that will be owned by the system? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's that. The the one percent vacancy, so that that is continuing with what has been done in previous budgets. So just so the public is aware, and this may be an oversimplification, but we're not we're not hiring to attrition. We're 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 hiring less teachers than leave because is that correct? Is that the way to look at that? I'm looking at Dr. Navarro and Ms. Acton. Well, normally, a, I'll, I'll start and then yeah, you can yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So normally in the budget world, a vacancy rate, it, it attempts to take into consideration that even in a perfect world, you're losing people throughout the year and you may re be replacing them with people that don't make the exact same wage, or it may take a period of time for you to hire those people so that there is a vacancy where you haven't had to pay that. Right. So that's what we are attempting. Um, to to uh, deal with in the budget is to say we know that there's going to be some vacancy so instead of putting the full cost of full um, staff we are, are budgeting at 99 percent okay and that's from a budgetary standpoint that's good but from a from a, a work standpoint that's not ideal because no, you've because got less people to deal with the same amount of, of students exactly and, and, and as programs. we have, have um, you know, with the attrition of the 26.5 staff that we have tried to realign with our end of the year spending, then it becomes more of a, um, a critical point. If, you know, if we are at 100% at staffing, um, you know, we would be short in okay. a perfect world. But I know um, Nikki would love it if we were at 100% right. staffing. So. My final question, you, you made a statement that, that a lot of those positions there, the, the things under the instructional budget increases, mm -hmm. were things that you normally would pay out of, out of end of year items. So does that mean then that, that that's probably going to drive our fund balance much lower if they're going to be part of the budget? 
Um, so they, they normally are, are covered with lapsed salaries. So where we've had vacancies okay. and the, the savings that we have in salaries, we have then paid for these programs. These programs have to be paid for. I mean, they're part of what we need to run the school system. So what we're trying to do here is to develop a budget that is more accurate with what we need, especially from the instruction side. These programs need to be in the budget instead of us waiting to see how much money do we have at the end of the year and, and what can we spend it on? Sure, and this is, I think, all my board members will recognize this is a bit more detail than we've seen in previous budget submissions. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, share it. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're gonna just dive a little deeper into what uh, Ms. Atkins just went through. Uh, CCPS's mission and goals are listed Highlights of our initiatives, which will be discussed later in detail in the presentation, include the early college program, expansion of our virtual program, illustrative math with a focus on Algebra 1, additional counselors, and the expansion of five bus routes. The budget's priority includes funding for salary incre increases, national board certification increases, and of course, the ability to attract and retain quality teachers. Looking at our FTEs, CCPS is projecting our FTE enrollment to increase to 27,130 students in FY23. This is an increase of 291 students over what we based the FY22 budget on last year and 1,144 additional students over our actual September 30, 21 count of 25,985. Taking a look at our special populations for CCPS, as you can see in each of the areas listed, we've demonstrated increases. During this 10-year time frame, farms or free and reduced meal students increased by 2,524 students. Our special ed population increased by 747, and our ELL population increased by 722 students. Next, we'll take a look at how every dollar is spent. The estimated cost per pupil for FY23 is slated to be $16,070, which is an increase of $865 over the FY22 amount of $15,205. Also, you will see out of each dollar, 66 cent goes to instruction, 12 cent goes to maintenance operations and capital outlay, followed by transportation, school admin, central office, and student and community services. Moving on, uh, how does Charles County rank among our peers in terms of a cost per pupil? We rank 12th out of 24 Maryland LEAs. You will see that we are higher than our neighbors in St. Mary's and Calvert, but below Prince George's County. So again, we'll take a look at the revenue um, schedule. We'll begin with a base budget of 408 million for FY22. We're requesting an additional 19.5 million from the county, which is a 9.9 .9 increase. Our unofficial estimated state funding is an increase of 8.4 million or 4.2%, which would bring our 23 budget to 435 million, which is a 6.8% increase. So where does this $438 million come, come from? We estimate that 50.6% or 220 million comes from the county, 48.2% or 209 million comes from the state, 1.1 or 4.7 million comes from local funding of which 3.3 million is the use of fund balance. Again, as we've stated, um, our state revenue, the unofficial estimate is $8.4 million. Our county funding here, we're saying 19.8, which reflects the amount excluding the one-time non-reoccurring costs, which are exempt from maintenance of effort. So for this year, it was the 240 for the 
North uh, Point Fiber Project and the 90,000 for the staff development. Taking a look at uh, the counting funding in terms of what they give us in comparison to their budget, you'll see that CCPS has ex historically received on average about 45% of the county's budget. So again, here we have the uh, schedule of all the expenditures that uh, Ms. Acton was going through. Um, this, it's a very long list of uh, everything that we are asking for this year. So we'll go through and kind of deep dive into some of these others. It's just a continuation of the expenditures. So where does all of the money go? With a $435 million budget, 80% is allocated to compensation, meaning salaries, wages, and fringe benefits, such as medical and retirement expenses. Secondly, 13% is allocated to contracted services, which includes, for example, salaries, wages, and benefits for bus contractors and school nurses. Since employees make up the largest portion of our budget, it only makes sense that a large portion of our proposed expenditures for FY23 include collective bargaining assumptions for both EACC and ASME. It's 16.3 million. Student transportation, as stated earlier, we're asking for an increase of 1.9 million, which reflects the recalibration of the current bus contractor pay scales. Other mandatory cost increase, again, as we said, we're asking for an increase of 2.9 million for healthcare costs due to increased claims and additional enrollments in our plan. Again, it has been two fiscal years since we've requested funding for healthcare costs. We're requesting an additional 570,000 for projected May premium increases, 488,000 for the nurses contract with the Charles County Department of Health for school nurses, an additional 2.1 million for the full year cost of the 4% ASME COLA adjustment made in the fall of 2021 as the result of the MAG study survey. Other costs, as we've stated before, uh, we'll begin with Blueprint. 901,000, which includes the 10 FTEs that we consumed from Title I uh, to the operating budget, in addition of one FTE for support for our pre-K expansion. 694,000 to create the Early College Career Readiness Program in conjunction with the College of Southern Maryland, which we discussed today. 127,000 to provide services to students with additional needs as the result of our increased ELL population. Next, we're asking for an additional 826,000 to expand our virtual program. As we said earlier, this is an addition of six FTEs, four teachers, one computer analyst, and one counselor, in addition to additional course offerings for digital courses through APEX. An additional 365000 for the expansion of the bus routes. As we had said earlier, the cost includes five buses, five drivers, two attendants, one mechanic, and we're reca uh, reallocating an existing transportation budget line to offset this. Okay, moving on, um, the addition of a chief of schools which will provide direct supervision of schools, school leader development, and the Office of Safety and Security. 930,000 for technology. This request will ensure that CCPS maintains our existing systems, replace and replenish outdated systems, and provide new students and staff with equipment. This also includes funding for our growing reliance on Microsoft Cloud infrastructure. 20,000 for closed captioning and live streaming for our communications department, 110,000 for the Office of Safety and Security for additional background checks and related supplies and hardware, hardware such as radios and repeaters. $1,200 to expand EAP or employee assistance programs with the Office of Human Resources. 
Now we move into the Department of Instruction. Uh, we're requesting to actually set up budget lines for all of the items listed, such as illustrative math with a focus on Algebra 1 and the addition of four and a half FTEs for counselors at the elementary level to assist, assist with mental health awareness. As you can see, there are several items listed. Um, and I don't know if we want to go through all of these, but there's, these are basically items, as we said earlier, we normally fund these with year end funding. And the plan is to establish an actual budget line for all of these items. So we have three pages of items that typically are part of year-end funding. Okay. Uh, lastly, we're estimating a budget increase of 745,000 for food and nutrition services. Meal services for FY23 will return to the National School Breakfast and National School Lunch Program because we are anticipating the seamless summer option waiver will expire on June 30th, 2022, which allowed all students to eat breakfast and lunch for free. Are there any additional questions? I'm sure the answer is yes, but <laughs> Ms. Wilson. Could, could you go back to slide 11? Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know, you might, you, you, you're not gonna know the, the answer, but I'm curious to know on this slide, you show what was allocated. How hard would it be for you for those years to show what we actually asked for? Is that something that I can Such go as our, you mean our original ask, not yeah. what we actually received? Yeah, correct. Um, we could probably get that's, that for you. I think that's easily done. Yeah. And then the, qu the question I'm curious to know is last year's budget, and fortunately we had some continuity, we asked for behavior, mental health. I'm curious to know for the last couple of years, how many times have we asked and have we actually received anything? And I believe the answer is no, maybe we got it, we cut it in our budget somewhere else. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Say, yeah, yes. How many years we've asked? Yeah, because we keep, we keep bringing up mental health. We keep bringing up mental health and it, we, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and guess what? We need me mental health. Um, we, we didn't receive it last year, as you recall. They did um, give us $90,000, which is part of what um, Carrie was talking about, uh, not outside of MOE for um, staff mental health um, fund, you know, to have resources for that, but we did not get what we had asked for as far as staffing. Right. This in particular that we're asking though for is for counselors in, this, in the elementary schools. Right, and so, okay. So the other question is, you mentioned nursing is a 13% increase and the attributing factor to, to, to such an increase? So uh, we recently met with the health department and what they are telling us is that um, they, part of the school nurses that we have are contracted with the health department. So they're not actual health department employees and the company that they are contracted with, their rates are getting ready to substantially increase. So therefore that's going to be passed along to us. So that's how we're anticipating that increase with that contract. All right. I, I'm going to back, back up to the, the first question. Part of the reason why I like looking at this chart chart I, I think i'm also trying to correlate the amount of growth that the county has experienced in correlation to what we've been asking in the budget um, um and then the other thing is the fact that you have showed that our free and reduced meals students and our special needs students there is there is a growing need mm -hmm. and just trying to show that we're just a growing county that demands you know, a lot more resources and just kind of having those numbers in perspective, I think would be helpful to share with our county commissioners as they evaluate priorities. Thank you. I'll follow up on that. Um, it wasn't too long ago when that number was was 50%, much closer to 50% than, than those numbers. And as Ms. Wilson said, um, uh, 
the county not not just growing in numbers but growing in um, the services that um, not not that people demand but that people deserve uh, and and that is laid upon the school system so I think that's an important point um, to drive home uh, I did have one question we there is not usually we have a line item for MOE in there but there is no quote MOE line item because even though our enrollment is expected to go up this year, it's based on last year's enrollment. Is that correct? So w the way MOE was calculated last year because we had the dip in enrollment, we right. basically had to take the, they gave us the option of doing like a three year rolling average. Um, so if we were to base our MOE on, um, basically our September 30th, 2019 numbers. Right. Um, that would be below what the county had funded us last year anyway. So we are basically saying we're not anticipating the county to fund us less than what they funded us for FY22. So that's why we're not really putting in a MOE line. Okay. We're just saying this is an additional amount that we're requesting. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from board members? We will have a work session on this at the end of the month. It's a lot to digest. Any questions? Ms. Battle Lockhart didn't text me, so if you have a question, Ms. Battle Lockhart, now's the time. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's take a break now and come back in 10 minutes at 3.15. Thank you, welcome back everybody. Uh, we'll now hear uh, from Mr. Heim on uh, project status updates. Good afternoon and happy new year to everyone and congrats Vice Chair uh, Ms. Wilson and also Chair Mr. Lucas. Uh, before we entertain questions about the project status update, uh, I would also like to echo the sentiments uh, expressed by numerous people today regarding building service uh, staff members and their efforts during uh, last week's weather events. Uh, as you know, we talk about uh, staff safety. Uh, you know, keep in mind when we have a code red day, you know, we still have staff members who are actually coming out in those elements, driving in those elements including our building service staff. So as the snow was falling on Monday, we had building service staff workers at our building and we made the decision around 8 a.m. as the conditions worsened and the visibility became uh, you know, very low to send them home. Uh, but also we had maintenance staff and we had maintenance staff who came out on Sunday. They got that uh, unwanted phone call for me on Sunday. So we started to look at the, the weather for forecast and they started to narrow down and the snow total started to increase. So. When we left on winter break, we did not have the plows on our trucks uh, and our pickup trucks are used for plowing because we use those trucks for other reasons uh, during, uh, you know, everyday day to day business. So they were called out on that Sunday to go out and uh, put the plows on and, and get ready to, uh, you know, start filling up the salt spreaders uh, in anticipation of that, of that weather. So, you know, we have many folks who work behind the scenes uh, on those code red days who are out in those elements uh, doing what they, they do. So greatly appreciate all that they do. And also to Mr. Snow and his transportation staff who are out uh, in the middle of the night uh, before many times before the county roads and state roads are actually deploying, uh, you know, their trucks and, and their staff to start uh, salting and, and plowing the road. So, you know, contrary to some of the comments out there on social media, our staff was out uh, anytime we had any of those vents in, in the middle of the, of the night uh, checking those, those road conditions. So we were out uh, you know, early Monday morning uh, around 3 a.m. Uh, before the snow started the, the fall. Uh, so there are numerous, as Dr. Navarro had said, numerous things that go into uh, those considerations and, and, you know, and the safety of student staff uh, is always uh, at the forefront of any decisions that are made and they are not rash decisions that are made. Uh, there are numerous people involved in those decisions and as Dr. Navarro said, consulting numerous sources and numerous other 
other uh, entities in, in, in the county. So I appreciate everything that uh, folks do to make sure that our schools can operate as close to normal as possible under those type of circumstances. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to our project status update. Uh, we are excited, uh, as we always are, about the projects that are ongoing in, in Charles County. And some of the projects that are listed here uh, in the very soon uh, future are going to be out for, for bid, uh, including the TC Martin renovation, the uh, kindergarten additions at, uh, at Malcolm and uh, J.P. Ryan, along with the uh, limited renovation and uh, creation of that fine arts program at McDonough High School. So we're here to entertain any questions you have. And Mr. Andrews, who's also joining me today, our Director of Planning and Construction. Steve, if there's anything you would like to add as well. Yes, uh, good afternoon, thank you, and congratulations to the Chair and Vice Chair on the appointments. The only other thing I would add is that uh, you will see that there are projects on here that are gonna be funded through Built to Learn funds, which come through Maryland Stadium Authority, and we've been working with them. There is a uh, MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that still is gonna have to come through and be signed. They are working on that. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth about which parties have to sign it. Um, the latest information that they got from the state attorney general's office working with them is that it has to include the county and the Board of Education. We have targeted that at the February meeting we would have um, that version, that draft version from MSA to present to you guys. The good news for us is because we are as far along our, as we are on the three projects that are going to move forward that are funded from MSA, they're basically acting as a funding authority for us, not as a project management entity. So they are not believing that that's going to make any indication of slowing down the process for us, even though we're bidding and we're still going through the MOU uh, review and approval and execution process. So just want to add that little bit of detail. Any questions for any board members? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Next is Mr. Schwartz with our legislative update. I'm sorry, too, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Didn't ask if you had any questions. No, thank you. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, this is the first legislative update of the session. The session starts tomorrow, but we already know some things going into the beginning of the session. Uh, the most important thing that we're looking to do at the beginning of the session is to see what's in the governor's budget. As you heard from the uh, budget presentation, uh, what the state provides is a, a crucial part of what we're going to be getting this year. The governor's budget will indicate the governor's intent to fund whatever programs he thinks is, is important to fund. As you know, the General Assembly is not allowed to add anything to the governor's budget. They can only cut from the governor's budget. Um, there was an item on the, uh, a, a referendum item on the um, ballot in 2020 that changes that authority to let the General Assembly add to the governor's budget. That passed, except that's not going to be going into effect until the 2023 session. So this is the last session where the governor's budget is really what we can expect to get from the state. Um, I'm going to talk about just a couple of bills at this time uh, going into this session. Um, the first bill I'm going to mention is House Bill 68, Senate Bill 40, which is a school construction bill. The bill would allow for the interagency on school construction, the IAC, to add uh, systemic construction projects to funding regardless of the amount of the request. This is a bill that MAPE supports and I think it'd be very helpful to us if we can get funding for uh, systemic construction projects. Um, the other bill I'm going to mention briefly is House Bill 146 which is dealing with reportable offenses. This bill actually would repeal the provisions of the law that allow for the uh, police to report to school systems whenever a student of ours is arrested for certain crimes of violence, uh, certain sexual offenses. Uh, the information we receive from the police uh, currently is used to make sure that the student who was charged or arrested is provided all necessary services and also to make sure that we're providing a safe and secure school environment for other students and staff in the school setting. This bill would repeal that and would only allow us to receive information once the student has been adjudicated through the court system. 
Uh, that's a concern of ours. Mabe opposes this bill, and it's, it's going to be a bill that I think we have to, to keep careful uh, eye on because obviously that would have a, a big impact on, on our operations. There are several priorities that MSEA has uh, indicated that they are um, pushing for. One is to negotiate class sizes. We haven't seen that bill yet and see how that's going to be worded, but that's going to be a concern of ours, obviously, if the uh, class sizes have to be negotiated at the uh, bargaining table. They're also looking to broaden the scope of mandated blueprint increases in salaries for employees for school systems, uh, which is um, something that the blueprint does not include. They, they have salary increases for teachers, but not for other employees. That would be obviously a very costly uh, program, but something that we would actually um, uh, hope that that the state would fund if, if the state provides additional funding for other school system salary increases that would be helpful to us the other thing i want to briefly mention is the state board of education mask regulation that they've adopted is that's in, in place now um, the state board had previously had a mask mandate in place that was to expire next month they've extended that now but what they've done is to allow for school systems to lift that mask mandate individually they call them off ramps if we can use that term that they've used and those off ramps are there are three off ramps one is if at least 80 percent of the county population in the county where the schools are located is fully vaccinated um, as reported by the uh, state department of health and if that happens the county board may lift the mask mandate uh, at a public meeting uh, that 80 percent uh, level has not we have not approached that in charles county right now we are about 63, 64 percent, and it doesn't seem like we'll re reach that 80 percent threshold anytime soon, uh, but we'll keep an eye on that certainly. The second off-ramp is local superintendent may lift the face covering requirement for a school facility individually uh, if the principal or school um, system as a whole designates that at least 80 percent of the school staff and students in the school have been fully vaccinated. Um, we're not tracking vaccinations at this time, so that's going to be hard to determine, but uh, if we were to do so, 80% would allow us to lift the mask mandate for that facility. And the third off-ramp is um, if the county has sustained 14 consecutive days of moderate or low transmission rate of COVID-19, as reported by CDC, um, the off-ramp is lifted and the mask mandate goes back into effect if the CDC reports that we've had 14 consecutive days or of substantial or higher rates. So. Those are the three off-ramps for the mask mandate, but otherwise the state board mask mandate is in place and we have to follow that for all of our school facilities. I'll be updating the board each month, obviously, on uh, uh, the latest information from the General Assembly. I know that Mr. Lucas and Ms. Brown are, are members of the MABE Legislative Committee and that, that committee meets regularly during the session to uh, provide input to and from local school systems. So if you have any questions, I can certainly address them at this time. Ms. Abel? Uh, the House Bill 126 about permanent daylight savings time in school. Yes. I think we should have that, in my opinion, we should have that on our radar as well and follow that or maybe even put a, send in a position on that. Uh, yes, it's, it's um, the latest thinking is it's not likely to pass. That bill's been in before. Uh, I think each year it may gain a little bit more support. But I believe, and I'm looking at it very briefly, I think it's only, it would only take effect if, uh, the, if other states also enacted. So I, I'm not uh, sure. Last year, the bill passed the House. It was House Bill 1013 last year. Right, but it didn't get and to it, the Senate. Then it was held up in the Senate, right. which was 840. Right. And it, it, again, I'm not sure there's enough support in the Senate this year to, to get this through. But this is a bill that MABE is following as well. Can we just add that to our list yes, for updates? Yes, Thank certainly. you. And I will uh, defer to your opinion that we don't need to send in an opinion at this time. I, I know that MABE is, is certainly following it. I'm not sure that MABE has uh, taken a position on the bill yet. They, they discussed it yesterday at the legislative committee meeting, but they did not take a formal position. Uh, the feeling was that the bill was likely not going to pass again this year. But again, if, if the board is interested, we can certainly put forward our position. You know, what I would suggest, and, and I just forwarded to everybody the, uh, the agenda from yesterday's leg NAVE's legislative meeting, and, and there's links. Um, 
to, to items that Mabe is tracking. If, if there are items, and certainly these two, since Mr. Schwartz um, gave them to us, if, if there are items that the board would like to present in position, um, then we can put that on, up, on an upcoming agenda. And if, it's, if, if the board votes to have a position on that, then, then we can send that forward. Ms. Brown? Do you know who introduced House Bill 146? I'm sorry, who introduced it? Yes. It was introduced by uh, Delegate Moon and Delegate Atterbury. Delegate Atterbury is the new chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, so obviously that's something we're going to have to keep an eye on any time the chairman of a committee uh, introduces a bill that comes back to that committee. That's something that we have to really be concerned about if we're not in favor of it. Okay. Do you have anything else, Mr. Schwartz? Not at this time, no. no. Any questions from any of the board members? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Lockhart. See, your text just came in. No, I didn't have a comment, but I just wanted you all to know that the sound is going in and out at times, so. Okay. We'll try to speak up. Thank you. Next, we'll have a presentation from Ms. Mackey on the new website. Good afternoon. Um, with me today is um, Susan Cox. She's a member of the communications team. She's our web content design specialist. And then also joining me this afternoon is Ms. Terry Wisman. She's sitting over at the PC. Um, she's a website assistant in our department, and she's going to help us navigate through today's presentation. Um, so Charles County Public Schools website launch. Um, here's our URL, we're all familiar with it, www.ccboe.com. Our slogan is New Year, New Look, and Way Faster. Um, just some data here that I thought would be interesting to share with you and the public is that our current website is connected to Google Analytics and our site visits from the first day of school for this school year to last week was almost 100,000. Um, student view, our careers are our um, current openings page, as well as parent view, overview, those are our top three sites um, with 100,000 hits for student view, careers over 47,000, um, parent view at about 38,000. Um, we also have data that we track um, in regards to daily website traffic. The first day of school, we had 26,000 hits. Last week, January 5th, we had over 30,000 hits. So we take a look at this data often to make decisions about content placement on our site, but also to take a look at um, what features people are accessing the most. So why are we redesigning? Um, the redesign process, we started in the spring of last school year. Um, so we've been working on it for about six to seven months now. Um, the design first was outdated. We launched the current platform in 2017. Um, so we're looking at a, you know, a four to five year um, time for change for that visual. Um, it's also more modern. It's clean. It better aligns with, um, I think, websites that people are current um, to seeing now in 2020. It's also easier to navigate and it portrays a little bit better um, on mobile devices. Right now, the current site, it's hard to navigate the main menu um, and it does feature a better responsive design. Um, our current site is also hosted on internal server space, so when we have issues internally with our servers, we have issues with our main website. We've had a couple of additional incidents um, within the school year where we're sending out emails that our main site is down, we're working on it. Um, and then our site became too cluttered, that's what we're hearing. There's a couple of main menus on our current site. You have the main menu at the top, you have the slideshow, you have a couple of main menus underneath, and then if you scroll down, the page just continues to grow. Um, and it makes it harder to, to find what you're looking for. 
Um, the search function also on our current site only searches separate sections, like our news section is a WordPress site, the Science Center is a WordPress site, some of our secondary, or excuse me, like our elementary education page is a WordPress site. If you go to search for content on our current template, you won't be able to find it. It won't access keywords within those different platforms. So um, our goal was to launch um, the new design for the main site as well as our school websites last week. Um, the decision was made to shift that for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, we had the weather closures that affected um, our ability to be internal on site to launch our sites. Um, we also, with the shift to virtual instruction, we knew that parents and students, as well as administrators, were familiar with going to our current design to access student view and parent view, so we didn't want to put an additional um, roadblock in for those families or students trying to access student view for virtual instruction last week. Um, we're working with a, a vendor, and it's on the next slide, called Final Sight. We're transitioning to um, a cloud-based platform. Final Sight last week notified us early on in the week, um, after we had discussed shifting the change due to our inclement weather closures, that some of the systems within their site, um, they had found some evidence of ransomware. Um, so they reached out to us and asked us to shift our launch to next week so that they on their end could have their security teams continue to look over um, their site to make sure that content um, wasn't missing. Um, so we decided to move that launch to next Tuesday, um, January the 18th. And what that'll look like is um, our current URL, the ccboe.com, and any school website, they will all auto-direct to our new platform. So if I have the school system website bookmark, which I do, I have my child's school website bookmark, when I click on that link after our launch next week, it's still gonna go to that same URL, but it's gonna be to the new um, format. So this is more details about why we transitioned. Um, Final site is our new host. Um, the websites are also ADA compliant. There's improved navigation. Um, we did consult with staff, and we did take a look at some of our analytics as well as some of our um, website communication survey data um, to take a look at some feedback on our current design to take a look at maybe what we could eliminate moving forward, how we could make the design more user friendly because that's our ultimate goal was providing that ease of navigation and user experience. Um, we also heard from internal folks who manage their school websites and our school websites that the new platform is much easier to use. It's much more user friendly on the internal side as well. So again, this goes into um, all of our sites will be hosted by Final Site. Each of the school web pages, um, we did connect with all of the school administrators. They all feature logos, colors. Um, a lot of the sites also feature school social media accounts to keep that site current and up to date. Um, again, users who bookmark a site won't have any access issues once we launch next week. So Susan and Terry are going to, rather than me talk about the sites and the features and whatnot, obviously a, a visual demonstration um, would give you a better idea of what we're going to be focusing on, what we're going to be moving to um, next week. So what we have today is, um, and I'll let Susan take over here, but we have a copy or um, a visual of the main school system website as well as one of our middle school websites that has been redesigned. So I'll let Susan take over. So good afternoon. We're just going to kind of walk you through so you can see what we did and why we chose what we did. You can ask questions, interrupt me as you want. So you can see at the top we put the new logo with our name. Um, that is clickable to get back to the site anywhere you are. That's the header. We have the translator. Terry's just kind of using the pointer since I can't. Um, we can translate up to 30 languages. It's a very, uh, I call it the Cadillac of translators. Uh, we have student view since it is a link to log into student view and parent view up at the top because those are the heavy, most visited pages we have. We have the digital library of resources which we currently call the electronic library. It's easy to access. We have a staff link that goes to my CCPS or the staff web pages. And then we have quick links. Quick links was something we have on our current site that everybody liked. Just a quick way to access information as you need it. Also in the header is a search, and as Shelley alluded to, uh, this includes all the departments and everything, so it's all part of this site. So this search will work much better. Uh, parents and students and stakeholders will be able to find what they need on our website because it's all included. 
Um, we have a button for the schools, so you can see you can easily get to any of the schools or centers. And we went with what we call a hamburger menu, which you can see the lines. This way, every menu item can be accessed. We had issues with that as it grew. Some menu items just were hard to reach. Um, you either had to shrink the font. This won't happen anymore. Um, we fixed it with this menu. We also like the hamburger menu. You can kind of close it off. It's a part of the header, so it takes up a lot less space. We also had the issue of our header being too big and people not being able to see content. So those were the reasons for that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you can, you can see the hero, we call it the hero slideshow. This is the way the modern sites are going, very large images. Um, CSM did this and we actually really liked it. That was one of the sites that we saw. Um, so you see the title and where Terry's pointing underneath that keep the safe, that actually links to a page. So each of these slideshow items can link off to either a press release or a page, just very dynamic looking. Um, those will be switched out every week, like our current site. So if you continue to go down, we have what we call the icon navigation. We have that on our current site and we really like it. It's a quick way to get to the most hit pages that we have. Now we updated the images, they're smaller, just look a little cleaner. We could put more on there, took up a little less space. So those, using those analytics, those are the pages that parents are looking to get to quickly. So if you continue down, we have what's called an image grid. We just think it's a very visual way to use photos and graphics for important pages that we need to highlight on our home page. Um, you can also use video in here, so you can highlight up and then um, view those pages quickly. If you keep going down, we have upcoming events. So normally you would see calendar events in here. So what uh, Shelley alluded to, Final Site is restoring their calendar feeds because we use a feed for our calendars. We use Office 365 and it's fed to our site and every school site and they're working on restoring this. So, the, so we have, normally we would have about 10 events that would come across, the upcoming events, or you can go up to where it says view more calendar and you can access a calendar page that has the whole, the whole calendar. You can scroll through by month or by week, however you choose. Then continuing down, we have the latest video feature. These are about three of Kyle's latest videos that he has, we can put on there. Um, you can click through his new news break, it's academic, or you can go up to the button and visit all the, have access to all the video. And then continuing down, we have at a glance, and this is a quick way to find the numbers about our school system. Numbers like our number of students, schools, CTE programs, employees, and our budget numbers. And then finally, we just have the footer. So that has our address and contact information. We have another place to put popular links people can get to. We have our social media icons that we can get to, directions, and then contact information. Okay. Does anybody have any questions yeah, about does the anybody main have site? Any questions or comments? Board members? It's a lot of content to run through. It is. Um, it's good. I, I'll just say I, I appreciate the effort, and, and particularly when you're, when you're trying to do something from a phone, and you mentioned scrolling and the font size, it can be, it can be challenging. So I appreciate that. Mr. Hurd. As the youngest person sitting up here, uh, I, <laughs> I greatly appreciate these changes, <laughs> and I cannot stress enough that for the vast majority of our students, when they're looking at this website, it is not from a desktop computer, it's from their phone. And I, I really resonate with the fact that you guys uh, really honed in on that and focused and prioritized that when you were redesigning the website. The only question I have is so, you, you mentioned that there's a change in where it's being hosted mm -hmm. rather than our servers. So how will that affect Synergy? Is Synergy going to be faster or is it hosted, does EduPoint host Synergy? EduPoint hosts Synergy, but it's a okay. separate system from Final Site, which we're moving to our websites to. Our current website, as well as our school websites, they're not part of the Synergy EduPoint platform. Okay, 
So, you know, in the past we've had issues where students are all trying to connect to Synergy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Do you think because uh, final, final site is, I know they're not hosting the website, uh, the Synergy website, but you know, they are hosting the redirect from our domain, I think, no? It's a direct link from our domain. So if you were to click on the student view or parent view right up at the top of the moon design, it's gonna take you right to that login page that's hosted with EduPoint and Synergy. So unfortunately, our transition from our internal space for the website and the school websites in particular to final site won't have anything to do with the, okay. the speed and the touch. access of Synergy and EduPoint. Well, you know, nonetheless, it's still an awesome change and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it is definitely much more mobile friendly. In our analytics, we would say half or 50% is mobile. So that was very much a consideration in, in what we chose. We just wanted to show you a simple page. Um, we were gonna show the superintendent's page. <laughs> we know she'd love that. Um, but it just shows some quick features that this is, it just looks a lot cleaner. Uh, it's clean text, it's easy to navigate. So we have the header up there. But we also have a left, what we call a nef left banner, and it has under about, so you can easily get within that uh, menu system down, you can click and see it. You also have above where the, yeah, the home and about and superintendent, that's called breadcrumbs. So there's a lot easier navigation. You can see where you are and you can go back easier. You can move within related pages easily. You can always go up to the hamburger menu and go through it that way. Um, one thing we did want to point out, we were talking about ADA compliance, and so what you'll see on the new site um, for the superintendent's contract is a button, and it's an ADA compliance it, uh, feature that uh, warns you that you could have a download to your computer. So we have other buttons too. Um, in Chrome, it will open in a tab, but in Edge, it'll download. So we need to warn people that that's a, that's, that could happen on their computer. We have a button that also is a link, like a little chain link, that warns you that you're going off of our site. Mm -hmm. So you will see those. That's one of the reasons we brought this page up. If you go over to the message from the superintendent, this was something she did in, in July, but we just want to feature a couple things. So she had a letter and she went down. We have what are these accordions. So she wanted the letter in Spanish, so it's a very easy way to put it on. We use accordions on our, our current site, but it's so much easier in final site. You can put them anywhere. It just helps manage all the content on the pages. You'll see this on ever busier pages. We can put everything on one page and people aren't going back and forth to a lot of pages. We can easily put videos right into the page. It's a push of a button as opposed to me putting in HTML code and things like that. Much easier for school webmasters and for us to put in ways to manage the pages. You can easily put columns. Here we're showing the transcripts. This is a tabbing system, so you can have it in English and Spanish. It's up at the top. Just a lot of ways that we can um, manage a lot of content on a page, and it just looks a lot cleaner, and it's a lot more manageable. Um, the editor also for the website has an accessibility button, so we can check and make sure that we don't have any issues. And if we do, it makes suggestions on how we can fix them. So we just wanted to show that page. And we're just going to show you a school site. So as you can see, it looks like it's all part of Charles County Public Schools, and that was our goal. We wanted it to be very cohesive. Obviously, we have the school logo and the school name. We have the same banner up there, except we added a button to the CCPS homepage. So that's how at any school you can get back to the CCPS main website. It has a search feature. It has the school button. So from any school or center, you can get to any other school or center. And it has the menu, uh, the hamburger menu that the main site has. Same slideshow, you can do the same thing. You have the titles and you can link that as Terry pulls it up. Th those quick links are customizable per site so they can change them up as they need them. Um, they also have the icon navigation. Right now it looks just like ours. A lot of schools want to be able to, from their site, get to these, to these 
um, pages on our site, but they are customizable per school. They can update them as they want. They have the features to be able to get to those pages quickly. Uh, if you keep going down, we have the image icon here. You can see they, they use the school colors. So in the underneath each of these grids, they put in the colors. We have Stoddard's up here. Um, so for each school, it's a little different. They added that styling. In here, you can also um, have video. So one of these grids, you could feature a video. So if Kyle does a video that features that school, we can put it in this grid. We did some customization. We had to get these all out on all 38 sites. So we used a lot of generic pictures. We did use the analytics. These are the most hit pages on the school site. And here we have middle school redistricting because we're on a middle school, so that goes to that page. And you can see that we had a picture of Stoddard students, so we used it in our school. So we're continuing to do that as we can. And um, just a feature of the school sites. If you keep going down, they also have a menu. They have the CCPS events in there, but they also have a calendar for their school events. They're intermixed in. Number one, request appearance is the calendar. So we always make sure we have that. They can also view a calendar page that has both the CCPS events and their school events in there. If you keep going down. Um, this is something that's just on the school sites. It's the social media feeds. Our, program, our department has a PR liaison program, and, and these uh, accounts are updated multiple times a month. And it's just a quick way. You're not only are you updating your Twitter feed, but you're updating your front page. And it shows the events that are going on. It's very easy. The other nice feature and why we have social media feeds on our sites is because you can scroll back. So if somebody wants to get a feel for the community, for the events that happened in the school, this is a great way to do it because the site should be updating. So some of that would come off, but this way you can go back and look and see what goes on at that school. Um, you can either view more and it's a page or you can actually directly go to Twitter in this case to see more. There, keep going down. We also put the latest news. This you can scroll through and get the latest press releases. This is so that parents can bookmark their school and they don't have to go back and forth so much on the important information of the school system. So they can stay on their school site or they can actually click the view more and they can get back and see more of the press releases. And I continue down and then you just have the footer and this is all catered towards the school. This is the information that principals definitely wanted to keep on their footer. That way it's, it's all there. They have their social media feeds if they want them, directions. So that's really it. I mean, if you have any questions, we're very excited about this. It's very modern, clean, much easier to navigate. Device, you know, device, I can't speak. It's responsive, it's ADA compliant, um, and it's much easier to use. Well, you should be excited. It looks very good, and you can tell in your presentation that uh, <laughs> um, you put a lot of hard work into that, so thank you very much. Are there any other questions from my fellow board members? All right, great. Well, we look forward to the uh, complete rollout when everything is ready to go. And part of that rollout I just want to mention is a feedback form that we're going to share with the community to solicit feedback on their use of the new site, if they see that there's content missing, if they're having trouble accessing a certain page. You know, we want the community's help in testing out these sites and taking a look at them and telling us if we need to restructure any menu items if we're missing anything um, so we will make that available next week as well very good before miss battle lockhart if you're there do you have any questions no i think it looks great i'm looking forward to checking it out very good thank you thank you All right. thank you very much All right, at this time, is there any unfinished business before the board? Seeing none and hearing none. Any new business? Ms. Abel. I believe we need to vote on the calendar revisions. We do. Thank you. Good afternoon. See everyone again. Um, so, at this time, I would like to uh, suggest that we move the uh, 
the marking period back a week because we have missed four days of uh, school this marking period. We've had students going in and out uh, this past month with, with COVID and there's been disruptions. Um, and it would be good to be able to get our students uh, some additional time and our teachers some additional time, additional week to get caught up and to be able to hand in their work and get uh, for, the, for the quarter. And so currently right now, the second marking period is uh, scheduled to end on the 19th. That's Wednesday. Um, the third period, marking period is scheduled to begin on the 20th. And then we have a, a day off uh, on the 21st for students, uh, but staff was scheduled to come in that day and, and use it for planning and grading. Because that was a, already scheduled into the calendar from the beginning of the year, and many of our families have, have plans probably on that day with their students off, uh, the suggestion is to, to keep that break on the 21st and not make uh, more disruption than, and have the students go off, but ha still have staff coming in and working on uh, some professional development in their schools that was scheduled that day and planning uh, for the third marking period. And then move the, the ending of the second marking period to the 26th, which is uh, the Wednesday, uh, one week later. On the 27th would be the third marking period beginning. And because our teachers do need some time to, uh, for the grades, we would be giving uh, students a half day on the 28th a two hour dismissal um, and have our uh, teachers working on grades at that, that period of time on the 28th. Questions? Ms. Sable? I thought we added two early dismissals. We did add two early dismissals. So we added uh, one in February and one in March. Those uh, early dismissal days, um, I don't have those. Let me try to get the exact dates. Wait one second. Uh, Wednesday, February 16th, and Wednesday, March 23rd would be uh, changed to two hour early dismissals for students. And the idea behind that is that we've heard from our staff coming up here many times about how the, the, the COVID has disrupted their school days um, where they are filling in for fellow teachers who are out. Uh, they're doing other duties because of uh, lack of staffing in some of our buildings and that they need more time and, uh, for planning. And so the idea would be to give uh, the half day, those two additional half days for our staff to be able to, to plan and get grading done and, and work on things that uh, have been disrupted because of uh, the COVID situation. Mr. Hurd. Uh, I said this privately, but I also wanted to put it on the public record that I support this change and that I think it is uh, needed for our students because we have to put our money where our mouth is and we have to be honest with ourselves that as much as we would have liked to have considered uh, this past week successful, there were a lot of people who were left out and I, I don't think you would be able to find many teachers who would say that they were able to get all their lesson plans in. And so I think it's important that with all the learning loss we've had that we own up to this one and we give a little bit more time for it to end properly as was planned. Thank you. Ms. Abel. I'd like to make a motion to approve the calendar revisions as recommended by Superintendent Navarro. Second. Motion by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Brown. Any further discussion? Ms. Bottle Lockhart? Yes. Yes. Did you hear that? There was a motion made by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Brown, to approve the changes presented by Dr. Navarro? I agree. I'm with it. Uh, okay. So we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, raise your hand. Yes. It's unanimous among board members present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any future agenda items? Ms. Wilson? 
Um, since we just talked about the calendar changes, I think we previously, uh, Mr. Er Eric mentioned about us taking a look at the calendar policy um, to revisit it as, as a result of this conversation. If that's the will of the sure. board. Is that the will of the board to have that as a item? Show of hands. Very good. Okay, thanks. And the second. I don't think there's anything wrong with the current policy. Just so everyone's clear, I mean, as far as, as, as what's in the superintendent's purview and what's in the board's purview. Yes. And then the, se the second item um, is maybe uh, a refresher. Um, uh, what are the legal challenges, legal responsibilities as it pertains to special needs population and discipline? And just having an understanding of our, when a disciplinary issue comes up and a student has been designated or, you know, what, what are the legal requirements uh, is and how does that affect the the distribution of uh, consequences? Um, can I request yes, just a little bit more clarification? Yeah. So, are we talking about um, just a refresher on due process and federal uh, requirements for since we receive IDA funds? Is that what you mean? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is that? Yeah, so it's if that's the will of the, the board. board and there's not only there there's there's as we saw a few years ago there's a potential monetary impact with that as well yes so uh, if the board would like to see that again mr hancock Ms. brown okay Ms. abel okay thank you mr chair all right Okay, anything else? Okay, then we are on break until 4.30 when we will have recognitions. Thank you very much. Kyle, please take us off. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are back, and now is the time on our program where we're going to have some recognitions, and we're going to start off with resolutions. Pass them out. So I don't know who has Black History Month. Black History Month. That's you. That's you. Okay. <laughs> and before you start, I'm sorry. Accepting is going to be um, Kim Harrison, the Director of Equity and Diversity. Okay. Board of Education of Charles County Black History Month, January the 11th, 2022. Whereas February has been designated as Black History Month in the United States and the theme for the 2022 year 20, 2022 is Black Health and Wellness. And whereas diversity of our nation, state and county reaffirms the need to be aware of and respect the rights of all people and their contributions to our country and to encourage good relations, not only with schools, but also the community. And whereas the Board of Education approved the 10 requirements to increase minority achievement and eliminate the opportunity and achievement gaps as a part of the strategic plan, and whereas members of the Equity and Diversity Unit Committee meet bimonthly to monitor the implementation and progress of the 10 requirements, and whereas equity training continues as a requirement for all system employees, now and therefore be it resolved that the Superintendent of Schools and the Board of Education of Charles County join the nation, state, and county in giving recognition to black history by representing, requesting all public schools to infuse instructional learning activities in all subjects throughout the school year, which incorporate black contributions 
and to provide appropriate ways of observance for Black History Month and be it resolved that a copy of this resolution be made a part of the record of the January 11, 2022 board meeting by order of the Board of Education of Charles County the, this 11th day of January, 2022. Dr. Maria Navarro, Superintendent of Schools, Michael Lucas, Chairperson. Next is a, re a resolution for Career and Technical Education Month and accepting will be Rebecca Pearson, the Director of Career and Technical Education. Resolution, Board of Education of Charles County, Career and Technology Education Month, January 11th, 2022. Whereas the legislature of the state of Maryland has recognized that the progress and well-being of the citizens of Maryland depends to a great extent on education and training for the world of work. And whereas the career and technical educators and career and technical students of this state hold as their primary aim the development of skills, leadership, and efficiency consistent with the American work ethic. Whereas the educators rising, the family, community, and consumers leaders of America, family and consumer sciences related occupations, the Skills USA vocational industrial clubs of America, the Technology Education Student Association, DECA, an Association of Marketing Students, American Welding Association, Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Technicians of America, Independent Electrical Contractors, Cisco Systems Incorporated, and the Health Occupation Students of America have joined efforts to give an added definition to career and technology education. And whereas February 1 through 28, 2022 has been designated Career and Technology Education Month by the Association for Career and Technology Education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County does hereby support February 1 to 28, 2022 as Career and Technology Education Month in Charles County. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be made part of the record of the January 11th, 2022 board meeting. By order of the Board of Education of Charles County, this 11th day of January, 2022. Signed, Maria Navarro, Superintendent of Schools, Mike Lucas, Chairperson. Next will be the resolution for Gifted and Talented Education Month. It's a resolution from the Board of Education of Charles County, Gifted and Talented Education Month, January 11th, 2022. Whereas Maryland now aims to reach world-class educational standards and produce a globally competitive workforce. And whereas gifted and talented students are defined by law as students who have <clears throat> outstanding talent and perform or show potential for performing at remarkably high levels of accomplishment when compared with their peers. And whereas Maryland recognizes that gifted and talented students are found in youth from all cultural groups and economic strata, and whereas the annotated code of Maryland specifies that gifted and talented students require different programs and services beyond what is provided in the regular school program in order to reach their full potential. And whereas the code of Maryland regulations 13A .04.07 specifies standards for gifted and talented education students identification programs and services 
professional development and reporting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County endorses the recognition of February 1st through 28th, 2022 as Gifted and Talented Education Month and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be made a part of the record of the January 11th, 2022 board meeting. Signed by Superintendent Maria, Dr. Maria Navarro and Board Chairman Michael Lucas. Our last resolution is National School Counseling Week. National School Counseling Week, February 7th through 11th, 2022. Whereas school counselors are employed in public schools to help students reach their full potential and whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to career awareness and development, and whereas school counselors support parents in furthering the educational, personal, and social growth of their children, and whereas school counselors work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, and whereas school counselors seek to identify and utilize community resources that can enhance and complement comprehensive school counseling programs and help students become productive members of society, and whereas comprehensive developmental school counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County herewith extends its appreciation to all school counselors for their commitment and dedication to students and does hereby proclaim February 7th through 11th, 2022, as National School Counseling Week in Charles County. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be inserted in the minutes of the January 11th, 2022 meeting. By order of the Board of Education of Charles County, this 11th day of January, 2022, Maria V. Navarro, Superintendent of Schools, Michael Lucas, Chairperson. Mr. Jones, you're uh, leading this next part on the agenda. Yes, uh, Ms. Miller is taking care of the next part here. All right. There are important people walking in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Board Chairperson Lucas, Vice Chairperson Wilson, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, and staff. My name is Chris Mahalan Miller and I'm the coordinator of district innovation for Charles County Public Schools. And I currently oversee the formative assessment programs in Charles County. Sitting here to the left of me are seven exemplary teachers that I've had the pleasure of learning with in coaching over the past several years with one goal in mind, improving student outcomes. These seven teachers were recently identified by the Maryland State Department of Education as earning an assessment for learning classroom of distinction. Charles County Public Schools was the only district in the state of Maryland to have teachers recognized for this distinction. With this recognition, these teachers may be asked to provide professional learning to colleagues around the state 
represent the Maryland State Department of Education at various conferences or learning opportunities and open up their classrooms to educators around the state so that others can learn from their expertise. The research regarding assessment for learning, also known as formative assessment, is very clear. When implemented with fidelity, students can see one year's worth of growth in a six month period of time. These teachers have a combination of over 750 hours of professional learning around the formative assessment process. It is my distinct pleasure to individually introduce each of these teachers to you. First, we have Ms. Erin Amor. Mrs. Erin Amor started her career with Charles County Public Schools in 2006. She took an MSDE sponsored training to be a peer mentor for her colleagues and serves as a teacher mentor and as a mentor to teachers who are becoming mentors. Amor was a finalist in the 2019 Charles County Teacher of the Year Award Program. She is currently participating in a pilot formative assessment course for MSDE called Student Agency and Learning and is expected to give input that will develop and improve the course for other educators in Maryland. One of the factors MSDE thought, stood, thought that stood out in Ms. Amor's class was the curiosity she stoked in her students. Ms. Amor continually asked students to explain the steps that lead them to mastery of their learning. Next is Ms. Nina Beard. Ms. Nina Beard began working for CCPS in 2004 and was Martin's nominee for the Washington Post Teacher of the Year and Charles County Teacher of the Year Award Program in 2020. She's participated in the many professional learning opportunities offered at her school over the past several years focused on implementing the formative assessment process with her students. Ms. Beard's ability to to ask follow-up questions to students, whether they give correct answers or incorrect responses, allows her to get to the core of her students' understanding and misconceptions. Mrs. Beard and her students determine their progress continually using success criteria to document and monitor each student's goals. This helps Ms. Beard know when students are ready to move forward and who needs additional support. Next, we have Ms. Nina Capuano. She's been a teacher with CCPS since 2006. In the past, she has been the lead teacher for, the, for two years for the Teach to Lead grant, which awarded TC Martin Elementary School $10,000 in funding to expand professional learning focused on the formative assessment process. She's also co-authored and co-facilitated formative assessment professional learning sessions and coursework for both CCPS and MSDE. Capuano was Martin's nominee for the Washington Post Teacher of the Year and Charles County Teacher of the Year Award Program in 2019. Capuano fosters an environment uh, where teachers are encouraged to share feedback with their peers and are allowed time to revise answers based on this new understanding. This helps to build student agency so that they rely less on the teacher and more on themselves and their peers for reaching their learning goals. Next is Ms. Kelly Lundeen. She's been teaching with CCPS since 2011 and was a CCPS finalist for the Washington Post Teacher of the Year in 2017. She's been the lead teacher for three years for a peer mentoring grant from MSDE, which awarded Crake $15,000 to expand its teacher mentor program. Lundeen was the keynote speaker for MSDE's 2021 Teach to Lead Conference and trained with MSDE to be a, co a peer coach for colleagues. She's currently participating in a pilot formative assessment course for MSDE called Student Agency and Learning and is expected to give input that will help develop and improve the course for other educators in Maryland. In the classroom, she is constantly asking students pre-planned, differentiated questions to see, see student progress and understand their thinking. Next, we have Ms. Molly Reap. Mrs. Molly Reap began working for Charles County Public Schools in 2009 and last month received a grant uh, from MSDE to attend a conference where she was trained on facilitating future coursework on formative assessment at Higdon. She's participated in every summer formative assessment professional learning opportunity offered to CCPS teachers since she was hired. 
Her expertise to use success criteria with her students has made her classroom one where teachers in our county come to observe and learn from her practice. REAP continually uses her class's success criteria to help students self-assess their progress. She also involves her first grade students in the creation of their own success criteria when identifying mastery of a specific learning goal. Her ability to help her students with their own metacognitive skills helps build student agency at an early stage with her young learners. Next, we have Ms. Taryn Walker and Ms. Melinda Wright. Ms. Taryn Walker is, an, is newer to Charles County Public Schools, having started with the school system in 2020. She co-teaches with Ms. Melinda Wright at Mount Hope Nanjamoy. Um, Ms. Wright is a veteran CCPS teacher, having taught in the system since 1992. In the past, Ms. Wright was a lead teacher for two years for the Teach to Lead grant, which awarded Mount Hope Nanjamoy $10,000 in funding to expand professional learning around the formative assessment process. Ms. Wright was the CCPS Teacher of the Year for 2019. The combined class of Ms. Wright and Ms. Walker allows them to not only teach together, but to plan together. They keep detailed data of student understanding and mastery to ensure that students continue to advance in their learning. They spend a great deal of time ensuring that their upcoming lessons are based on data they have collected from previous lessons. This allows their time with students to be dedicated to the individual needs of their students. I've been sending teachers to observe second grade classrooms at Mount Hope Nanjamoy since 2018. Please help me congratulate these exemplary teachers and their recognition from MSDE as having earned an assessment for learning classroom of distinction. That is, I didn't, that is really great. Can you read that one part again about how many counties in the state had? Oh, let me read that yeah, again yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, please, Chair. please. Lucas. Uh, Charles County Public Schools was the only district in the state of Maryland to have teachers yeah. recognized. That's and we awesome. were not the only, I mean, there were other applicants in other counties. We were the only district in the state that had teachers recognized for this. That's incredible. Another round of so, so many nice things were said about you. If you each like to take just briefly a minute, if you'd like to say any words, um, and we'll just start um, with Ms. Amore and go down the aisle. I, um, I am humble about this award. I'm very surprised when they even came into our schools to present the award. Um, I love teaching. I've been in Charles County. I'm not from originally from Charles County. I'm from Michigan. So I'm one of those teachers that came to a job fair and Charles County was there and <laughs> came over. And here I am still 16 years later. Um, invested a lot of time and effort into the county, but love being here and love my love my job, love my colleagues. And um, it's just been a very great experience being in this county and being able to be part of all the teaching and learning that goes on here. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Miss Beer? Well, I am the complete opposite. I was <laughs> <laughs> born and bred in Charles County. I went to James Craig Milton Summers in McDonough. Um, my own sister actually uh, teaches. Uh, right now she's at Pickawaxen, and she was basically my mentor and the one I looked up to to become a teacher. So I need to thank her, Miss Christine Gamble. Um, I also was completely surprised when they came in with the award. Um, my kids were so excited, and to this day, they talk about um, that their teacher got a special award, and <laughs> they did not want me to take it home, so I have it sitting on my bookshelf in the room so they can see it every day. They're very excited, um, but I'm, I'm like, I, like she said, I'm really humbled about it, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Ms. Capuano. I'm a transplant. Um, this is my 16th year here, originally from New York, where I was also recruited and brought down. Um, I have two kids that are in our Charles County system right now. So I have a middle schooler and I have an elementary school kid. So this county means a lot to me. Um, they've done very well with my kids and it means a lot to be a teacher in the system as well. 
I think there's a lot of great things that have gone on in our county that's still going on, as you can see, but a lot of the work that's being done. So just really humbled by the experience and appreciate our Martin family, especially and our administrators that have backed us up, including Ms. Miller. Very good, thank you. Ms. Lundeen. I'm from Calvert, but I came to Charles, <laughs> <laughs> Charles to teach, and I have stayed here. I've actually stayed in Craig my entire 11-year uh, career. In a lot but of ways, we like that more. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's a great place. Um, Craig, uh, I'm thankful. Uh, I'm first grateful for the opportunity and for the recognition, so thank you to the board members for that. Um, I just think of all the th people that I want to thank. Um, of course, my family for being supportive from the beginning. My teammate, Aaron Amor, uh, we're partners in crime with everything we do, so it only made sense for us to do this together, too. Uh, the rest of the staff and administration at Craig has always been supportive. We're like a big family. Uh, Chris Miller, wherever you went over there, <laughs> she's the master of formative assessment, has been a, a, a kind of voluntold to be a mentor for us over the last four to five years, but we're really grateful for that. Um, so thank you for this opportunity and for the recognition. Thank you very much. Hi. So Miss, is it ripe or reap? I'm sorry. Reap. Okay. Um, so I was born and raised in Charles County and after college came back because I thought I could get a job here and I thought I would eventually leave, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so I'm still here. Um, and again, like everybody has said, I'm just so humbled and I was completely shocked when they came into my classroom to present the award because this was a very rigorous process to earn this award and I was just completely thrown off and very surprised um, but also the hard work that all of us put into it I'm just very thankful that we had the opportunity for it and thankful to um, Dr. Finnegan my principal and Mr. Busby my vice principal who have really been supportive of um, everybody coming in to watch um, and the obser observations and things and especially to Chris Miller because a couple years ago I probably would have laughed about formative assessment and mm -hmm. not given it a chance but she really goes out of her way to make us feel like this is something we can do and that we can excel at and i'm really thankful for her oh, thank you for those words miss walker miss wright yes we are so honored to be here today um i wouldn't be here without her because oh. i'm a second year teacher so i came in like not knowing anything about formative assessment and now i feel like i can implement this on my own and i wish every first year teacher had the opportunity to experience something like co-teaching because it's so helpful and you learn so much from being with a, um, uh, another teacher your first year. I also went to school, Charles County Public Schools. I graduated from Lackey High School. So it's an honor to be here and serve my community in this way. Well, I can't say enough about formative assessment. I think I'm the biggest cheerleader for it. I've been uh, so grateful that Chris brought that to our school many years ago. And I just think that is the change. That is the way to close the achievement gap. That is what we need to get students to own their own learning. So kudos to Chris for doing that and showing me the way. Um, it's wonderful to be in a classroom where the kids take over. For example, today in math, one of my students, and I wouldn't say as a high flyer, would say, no, our learning target is this, so I have to change it. I take the poster down and put our learning target up, and I like kids better. So. They can own their learning, they know what they're doing, they know how to show their learning, and it's all formative assessment, and every child wants to learn. So I think this is the way. Yeah. So we would like more, yes. more professional development more training, in this, yeah. and more training, and we would open our classrooms to anybody to come yeah, in, because please come, yep. it makes you enjoy your teaching. It, it's such a joy to be there. It's, you're a team, and that's our most important stakeholder, is the students. So, formative assessment is the way. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for all your comments. work and, and your accomplishments are well deserved. So, thank you. Are we doing a picture next? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are we all going up at Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I did. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> We're all learning this again. <laughs> Nope, not me. Who is you? It? You. That's you. Congratulations. Thank you. Walker, Okay, Mr. Jones, are we ready for the student recognitions? Okay. Well, good evening, Board Chair Lucas, Board Vice Chair Wilson, Board Members, Dr. Navarro and staff, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. The real reason why we are here, why we do what we do. We have assembled this evening to recognize a small sampling of the greatness we have in the young people we serve. Tonight, I'm pleased to present to you four students who have been identified by their school principals as exemplary student models in the following areas. Academic achievement, personal responsibility, and career readiness. Students being recognized this evening are Sanai Farrell, 12th grader from Thomas Stone High School, Madeline Sofer, 8th grader from General Smallwood Middle School, Jernaya Young, 5th grader from William A. Diggs Elementary School, and Kevin Mejia Troches, 5th grader from J.P. Ryan Elementary School. The latter, latter three students will be introduced a little later. But at this time, we are going to have the principal from Thomas Stone High School, Ms. Shanif Pearl, to report to the microphone to introduce her student, Ms. Sanai Farrell. Ms. Pearl, please, to the microphone. And welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sanai Farrell is a 12th grade student at Thomas Stone High School and is being recognized in the area of academic achievement. Sanai has phenomenal leadership qualities and her caring personality is contagious. 
taking the most challenging courses offered, which include eight advanced placement and 13 honors classes while maintaining a GPA of 4.47, Sanai is a student who has achieved high standards such as earning her academic letter and academic pen throughout her high school career and has clear goals for her future. Sanai was an intricate part of the junior monthly newsletter to students during our year of virtual learning. She provided excellent ideas that assisted in support of her peers focusing on their mental health as well as ideas to support them academically. Sanai's contributions, commitment, and dedication were impactful and greatly beneficial during this difficult time. Sanai is a true inspiration. Sanai is a member of the National Honor Society, the Student Government Association, the Distinguished Young Women of Maryland, earning a scholarship in 2021 from the organization. She volunteered to be a mentor in the Cougar Connect program during virtual learning last school year. And she, is also, she also represents the student body in the PBS meetings. She has been a member of the varsity tennis team of Thomas Stone as well. To expand her education outside of school, Sanai has attended summer leadership programs such as the Princeton University Summer Journalism Program, where she had a published article in their newspaper. Sanai was also in the Girls Who Code Summer Immersion Program this past summer. Sanai actively volunteers for the Special Olympics of Virginia and the University of Maryland Charles Regional Hospital assisting the nursing department. Sanai works hard to maintain honor roll status while having a rigorous academic schedule, demonstrating student leadership and participating in extracurricular activities. We have recently learned Sanai has been accepted to her top choice of Princeton University for the fall of 2020 with intentions of, ma of majoring in English. Thomasone High School is delighted to recognize Sanai for this award. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm well. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. That is quite an impressive list of accomplishments. Thank you. So, um, when you're not in school, what do you like to do? Um, I enjoy reading and I also like to watch a lot of TV and movies on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like, like. Real Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Congratulations on all your accomplishments and in your future uh, to, to get accepted to a school uh, such you. as Princeton is very prestigious. So good on you for that. Thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Yes, I wrote something up. Um, with honor, I greatly appreciate being the recipient of the Academic Achievement Award from the Charles County Board of Education. I cannot be recognized for this achievement without also thanking the wonderful people who helped nurture my academic growth as a student. First, I would like to thank my counselors, Ms. Attic and Ms. Morton, who provided me with immense opportunities in and outside of school. I would also like to give gratitude towards the following teachers, Ms. Bolden, Ms. James, Ms. Sewell, Ms. Green, and Ms. Hatch, for guiding me through my high school career, helping to shape my character and integrity as a student. As the great Martin Luther King Jr. once stated, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Lastly, I would like to thank my immediate family for never doubting my potential as a scholar by supporting me academically and emotionally. All of you have graciously provided me with the necessary resources that have continued to guide me through my academic journey. Thank you. That was a very nice speech, thank you. And now Miss Wilson has some things for you and we're gonna take a picture.
right, thank you, Ms. Pearl, and congratulations once again, Sanai. Please now welcome to the microphone the principal from General Smallwood Middle School, Ms. Brenda Tillotson, who will introduce her recipient tonight, Madeline Sofer. Ms. Tillotson. It is with great bulldog pride that I introduce our choice for exemplary student, Ms. Madeline Sofer. Madeline is an eighth grader at General Smallwood Middle School and is being recognized for the area of personal responsibility. Madeline is hardworking and her academics is an honor roll student. During her years at Smallwood, she's been part of our girls mentoring group along with participating in the Spelling Bee. She's a member of the National Junior Honor Society where she serves as treasurer. Her math teacher, Mr. Anderson, states the following. I have had Madeline in my math class for the past two years. During that time, I found her to be conscientious about her studies, always ready to be an expert, always ready to help a peer in need. She is caring, kind, and very hardworking. I am proud to be her teacher. Outside of school for the last six years, Madison has participated in competitive cheerleading, which demands much of her time. Despite these commitments, Madison ensures she excels with her schoolwork. Many of her teachers say, along with being a hard worker, she can always be counted on to help her fellow classmates. These traits will be a great asset as she believes she desires to be a school counselor. Madeline is an exemplary student who serves as a role model for other students. We are proud of her accomplishments and we congratulate her and her parents on this recognition. Madeline, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Congratulations. Personal responsibility um, at any age is a good trait, but particularly for someone as young as yourself, you should be very proud that you're being recognized for, you. the, for this. So you do competitive cheerleading. Does that involve a lot of traveling? Uh, yeah, it does. Wow. Most, mostly on the weekends? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know how when we were young, we still couldn't get good grades when we had all this time in our hands, and kids, at least me anyway. And kids, you know, they're always busy in the weekends and after school, and yet they're, they're getting awards and doing so well. So uh, <clears throat> congratulations, and uh, I know you're going to continue to do well. Is there anything you'd like to say? I would just like to thank my family, especially my parents, who have made sure to keep me doing well in school and my grandmother, who has always pushed me to do well. Um, and my friends, who always keep me like not as stressed about school. So yeah, that's that. Oh, I have very good congratulations. And uh, you know, that parent theme is one that always uh, seems to be present in, in everyone that sits in those chairs. So thank you very much and congratulations. <laughs> We're gonna take a picture, don't walk away. Congratulations again, Madeline, and so please now welcome to the microphone the principal from William A. Diggs Elementary School, who will introduce her recipient this evening, Ms. Janiah Young. Ms. Calvert. Good afternoon. I am proud to introduce you to our exemplary student, Janiah Young. Janiah is a fifth grader at William A. Diggs Elementary School and is being recognized in the area of career readiness. Although it can be difficult at such a young age to know what you would like to do in the future, Jerniah already has her sights set on being a teacher. She says that Miss Smith, who is her current fifth grade teacher, is her role model. And having been a hawk at Diggs since pre-K, she credits all of her teachers from the past seven years for inspiring her desire to pursue a career in education. 
She says that it is not just what her teachers taught her, but more importantly, how they made her feel. And that's the kind of person she is and the kind of person she aspires to be. Jernia's teachers describe her as a leader in the classroom and a role model for her peers. She displays a true love for education and is always ready and eager to learn. This is displayed through the many accolades that she receives in school, including awards for student of the quarter, Hawk Pride, and honor roll. She has consistently received A's and B's on her report cards since third grade and credits her success in school to being attentive, organized, and ready for new challenges. Although math is Janiah's favorite subject, she enjoys working with young, younger students at Diggs on reading skills such as letter identification. Outside of school, Jernia practices gymnastics, enjoys her nephew, and takes care of her two cats and two birds. She is truly a caring person who is always looking out for the needs of others. Jernia is an amazing student who has earned the respect of her classmates and teachers. The, Diggs at, the staff at Diggs is grateful that we have had the opportunity to teach such a well-rounded student for seven years. I am proud to present to you the Diggs Exemplary Student of the Year, Jernia Young. Jernia, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. you when Ms. Calvert read um, some things about you, she said that uh, you never forgot how your teachers made you feel. Is that right? Yeah. So it's kind of very fitting. Maya Angelou said something about that. And it's very fitting that that, uh, that comes up today. So I'll ask you the same thing. What do you like to do when you're not in school? I like to play with my sister. Nice. Older or younger? Older. Very good. Very good. So... Um, you want to be a teacher? That's great because uh, Dr. Navarro will have a spot for you when you when you graduate. Okay, so come come right back to Charles County. Is there anything else you like to say? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We're going to get some pictures and give you some things. Last but not least, young Mr. Kevin Mejia Troches, fifth grader from J.P. Ryan Elementary School, will be introduced now by his principal, Dr. Melinda Tyler. Dr. Tyler? This way. Good afternoon. I am pleased to introduce Kevin Mejia Troches. Kevin is a proud fifth grade Cardinal Scholar at J.P. Ryan. He has two brothers and Kevin is the middle child. He is inspired by his big brother to be kind to others and is a role model for his younger brother inspiring the same. Kevin has been a proud Cardinal Scholar since second grade. He has been a straight A student every quarter since the third grade. He is reading well above fifth grade level and has identified that reading is his favorite subject. He enjoys learning new vocabulary and aims for higher levels and is already thinking about his sixth, his sixth grade reading goals. Kevin is a proud member of our winning Mesa team. He is the captain of the mobile app challenge. He has been passionate about the challenge since the first day of school. He has spent countless hours outside of school working on coding and user interface design. For fun, he likes to code games. Kevin said that when he grows up, he wants to be a computer programmer, cross-connecting his academic intelligence and brilliance across multiple subject areas. Outside of Mesa, Kevin is a school safety patrol, 
clarinet player and enjoys listening to electronic dance music, AKA EDM. He takes pride in his positions <laughs> and serves as a role model for other scholars in school academically and socially. Kevin consistently exhibits the cardinal core values throughout the school day. A few compliments from his current and previous teachers include, Kevin is always a role model. Every day he comes to school, he exemplifies what it means to have honor, integrity, grit, and hope. Kevin is kind to all students and treats everyone with respect. He takes pride in all of the work that he does and is consistently striving to be better. Fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Valdez. Kevin was an amazing student. I had him for virtual learning last year. He was always willing to add to conversations. He was enthusiastic about learning and he used problem solving skills to persevere through technology issues. Ms. Chavez, fourth grade teacher. Kevin is outstanding, intelligent, bright, and one of the best students any teacher could ask for. Mr. Tyler, third grade teacher. For all of these reasons and more, Kevin is more than worthy for the academic achievement recognition by the Charles County Board of Education. Remember his name, Kevin Mejia Troches, because soon you will be installing an app on your cell phone that he will invent. <laughs> the sky is not the limit for him. I present to you Kevin Mejia Troches, a J.P. Ryan Cardinal Scholar who flies high and soars every day beyond the clouds of excellence and success. All right, Mr. Lucas, this concludes our portion, but certainly you'll want to take a few minutes to speak to this young man, I'm sure. Yeah, All right. Kevin, outstanding. For fun, you like to code games, for fun. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, what kind of games? Um, I make um, games like Mario. I, I just make like um, remakes of the game. Okay. And um, I also try to make games with music. Very good. With your EDM music, right? So very good. You know, something I picked up on, and you're, you're getting recognition for academic achievement, but it also said you're a role model. And that, that's about as high as the compliment as someone can get when, when they refer to you as a role model. So congratulations on that. Um, I have no doubt your future is uh, whatever you would like it to be. So is there anything you. else you'd like to say? Um, I would like to say um, for thank you for having me here. And thank you to my fifth grade teacher for giving me this opportunity. And that would be all. All right, that I'll be fine. Thank you very much. We're going to get a picture. mentioned a moment ago, Mr. Lucas, this concludes the student portion of, of tonight's recognition. And so now we will have our staff members recognized. And so I will bring to the microphone Ms. Shirlene Ogburn, Supervisor in Human Resources, and she will do the honors. Ms. Ogburn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Good evening, Chairperson Lucas, Superintendent Dr. Navarro, board members, executive staff, colleagues, and family and friends. We are so excited to be here today to recognize our exemplary, exemplary employees. Our first recipient is Ms. Joyce Dorsey, a building service worker at Thomas Stone High School, and she will be presented by her principal, Shanif Pearl. Caring, committed, and consistent, Ms. Joyce Dorsey is a highly valued member of the Thomasstone High School staff. Her personal passion for the work that she does is conveyed in her constant execution of any assignment 
in extreme excellence, leaving an indelible impact on our school. Ms. Dorsey is undoubtedly an integral part of our Building Service Day crew, and our school is certainly made better because of her. Ms. Dorsey has a list of duties that would be difficult, if not impossible, to summarize in this moment. Working both outdoors and indoors, she ensures the beautification and upkeep of our campus by maintaining a daily routine inclusive of everything from grounds maintenance and trash pickup to sanitation and emergency interventions. Since the onset of the global pandemic, Ms. Dorsey has gone above and beyond making sure all protocols are followed so that students and staff are in a clean and safe environment. Ms. Dorsey is a template of efficiency and efficacy after which others can model themselves to achieve success. She continuously sets high standards for herself and for those who are watching, many of whom she isn't even aware they're studying. Punctual and professional, Ms. Dorsey is not only present essentially every day, but always also early. Oftentimes, when unexpected incidents emerge during the duty day that require building service assistance, she is the first to respond. She does so with the flexibility, a peace, and a patience that is an automatic calm amidst any chaos. Ms. Dorsey's attention to detail sets her approach to any task that she takes on, allowing her to finish the job with a precision that is unmatched. She possesses a work ethic that is driven by her own personal values, which means she upholds these standards whether publicly recognized or not. Her efforts directly contribute to making our school conducive to learning and growing by providing a more welcoming and enjoyable atmosphere. She is, indeed, what a leader can only hope for in an employee. In addition to Ms. Dorsey's outstanding work ethic, her attitude and positive disposition <clears throat> make her a pleasure to work with. She moves throughout the day with a joyous greeting, an infectious smile, and an exuberant demeanor. Thomasstone High School is delighted to recognize Ms. Dorsey for her contributions to our school community. Well, Ms. Dorsey, I can only imagine these past couple years have been nothing short of, of almost a 24-7 on-call, hey, can you, can you come do this and take care of things? And, um, I'm sure I speak for the board when I say thank you for all your, your hard work and dedication. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? I sure would. I would also first like to thank Ms. Pearl and definitely, like I said, Ms. Pearl, my principal, for having me here. Like I said, it's always a pleasure to be a part of the Thomas Stone family, almost in tears. They're like a family that I just can't, I cannot tell you. Like every, everybody's like, well, when are you going to retire? I was like, that's a family. Mm. So even, I don't care if you go to another school, you can be at Thomas Stone and go to another school. You always remember that family impact and the love they show you, whether you're going through something or you having that day, they always make you say, you know what? There's no place that I'd rather be than there. And having three kids go through the system myself and seeing what teachers go through, just trying to get kids to do what they're supposed to, my thanks is to you know, all the teachers and everywhere else that are doing what they're doing right now. So the little bit that I do, it's my honor. Like I said, thank you all. Well, thank, thank you. you. They're very fortunate to have you as part of their family. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Congratulations again, Ms. Dorsey. Our next exemplary employee is Ms. Valerie Morris, a guidance secretary from General Smallwood Middle School represented by Principal Brenda Tillotson. <laughs> It 
It is with great bulldog pride that I introduce our choice for exemplary employee, Ms. Valerie Morris. Mrs. Morris works as our counseling office secretary, but she is so much more than this to our Smallwood family. Mrs. Morris is in her eighth year at General Smallwood, and I am proud to say as a vice principal at that time, I interviewed and hired her. <laughs> she has totally lived up to and even surpassed my expectations. I thought she would be very polite, respectful, and hardworking, but she is this and so much more. Mrs. Morris has an excellent support to our counselors as a counseling secretary. She is the face of this department and works with our students and parents. Mrs. Morris takes a lot of pride in her job and takes the time to do things right. She goes above and beyond to help students, staff, and parents. She is willing to work past her normal work hours to ensure her the job is completed at a high level. I will often see that most of the teachers have left, the counselors have left, but I will see Ms. Morris going to her car much after the hours, and there's no overtime for the work that she does at our school. A huge resource to us is something that is not anywhere in Ms. Morris's job description. She really looks out for the physical needs of our students. Smallwood typically has the highest percent of farm students of any middle school. Our students have a lot of needs. Mrs. Morris works with our community outreach program to meet these needs. She coordinates with our counselor and PPW to determine what students that need this extra assistance. The items she gets from these organizations helps our students be successful. It is hard for students to focus on academics when they are hungry without proper clothing and school supplies. Mrs. Morris works with these outside organizations to help so many of our students and their families. She has a huge heart and this shows by the support she gives throughout the school year. General Small would like to thank Mrs. Morris for her hard work and dedication. She has proven herself to be exemplary and we are very fortunate to have her at our school. Thank you, Mrs. Morris. Ms. Morris, congratulations. I feel very lucky to be at General Smallwood with the outstanding uh, administrative team and the teachers just all, are all wonderful. My counselors are just the best. And what we are able to do with our kids, our kids' needs, as Ms. T said, are high. Many of them have very high needs. And if you come into my office, you'll see tubs of clothes and <laughs> tubs of all sorts of supplies. I have to say my proudest accomplishment at Smallwood has been working with the community support group and when a need we have a need we put it out by email and they meet it every single time so I can have students come in at any time or teachers for supplies for whatever they need that particular day so that is what really makes me enjoy my time at Smallwood well, thank you so much. It's, it's very evident, and, and your enthusiasm is infectious. So thank you for everything you do. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. And Congratulations again, Ms. Morris. All right, our next exemplary employee is Ms. Michelle Garcia. She's a pre-K instructional assistant from J.P. Ryan Elementary School, and she'll be represented by her principal, Dr. Melinda Tyler. I am pleased to introduce proud J.P. Ryan Cardinal Nestor, all the way from El Paso, Texas, Mrs. Michelle Garcia. She has been married to her lovely husband for 23 years and has two beautiful college-aged daughters who are products of CCPS, who are here this evening. In her free time, she enjoys reading and family board games. I hear the Garcia gang can be quite competitive, especially scrapping and Scrabble. Ooh. 
Miss Garcia is completing her sixth year at J.P. Ryan as an energetic, humble, and quite nurturing instructional assistant in the pre-K classroom. She and our 21-22 Washington Post Teacher of the Year nominee, Mrs. Jamie Parks, make up a dynamic duo arriving each day to meet the needs of our youngest scholars with the brightest smiles and warmest classroom environment. Their classroom was selected to be a model classroom for other classrooms in the county for their exemplary practice and camaraderie for teaching and learning. She shares that the best part of the pre-K classroom is seeing the joy in the little faces when the light bulbs of learning turn on. She is especially fond of the unique humor of pre-K learners. Her funnest memory includes one morning, after spending substantial time carefully and routinely drawing her eyebrows on, being asked by one of her pre-K learners, why are your eyebrows so angry? <laughs> Mrs. Garcia could only chuckle and think maybe I drew them too harshly that morning. <laughs> she could not help but to grin from ear to ear when sharing this memory and also asserting that a current fifth grader who was in her class six years ago sealed the deal for her in education by giving her a promise ring. She thinks of it as a symbol of agreement to return each year to J.P. Ryan and has not faltered on this promise. Each, each time she sees the fifth grader, she is reminded of this commitment. As you can tell, there is never a dull moment in pre-K. <laughs> Mrs. Garcia's dedication is evident by how she greets our scholars every morning with a smile during bus duty, during rain, sleet, snow, or hail. She does not hesitate to step in when we are short-staffed and can even tell when some mornings aren't going too well for our learners. She can see her frown even through the mask and quickly jumps in to find out what's wrong and gets them support. Mrs. Garcia is always an interpreter, is also an interpreter for the county and her services are beneficial even during our virtual events. She is passionate about supporting our Spanish speaking families. During the initial COVID shutdown, Mrs. Garcia consistently signed up to distribute packets and materials at a time when most did not want to leave the safety of their homes. Mrs. Garcia is an avid participant in professional development, including connected for learning and conscious discipline sessions. She acknowledges the importance for the IA to be well-versed in instructional practice. This is evident when visiting her classroom. She, you can catch her sitting on the floor, sitting on the table, under the table with our scholars and working with small groups. She also encourages our newer IAs and offer recommendations and solutions when needed. When asked about her why for education, Mrs. Garcia says she wakes up each day realizing that our little minds need to be shaped and she is ready and willing to go beyond the call of duty to lay the necessary early childhood foundation. She works to oppose her own not so positive experiences in the classroom to create everlasting memories for her scholars. Ms. Garcia plans to eventually pursue a degree in education and become a classroom teacher. I guess that promise ring from six years ago certainly sealed her love for education, and we are grateful to have Ms. Garcia as a member of our proud Cardinal Nestor team. I present to you Mrs. Michelle Garcia. She epitomizes our staff theme of being a nurturer who is empathetic, supportive, and tolerant. Congratulations, Ms. Garcia. Congratulations, Ms. Garcia. El Paso, did I hear that correctly? Yes. Oh, yeah. Flown in there many, many a time. And I like board games too, so we have something in common. <laughs> um, we're going to hold you to being a teacher. So we, we heard it publicly here. So in a few years, we'll expect to see you uh, with your own classroom. So thank you so much for everything you do. Um, for each of the, the people that are being recognized, there's a little write-up here on all of them about their accomplishments, and hers is, is quite lengthy. So um, good on you for everything you've done. Is there anything you'd like to say? Um, yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Tyler for the nomination. Um, it came as a surprise uh, to be recognized for doing something that just brings me joy. Um, most days it's not a job. It's just something that I enjoy doing, coming to work. I'd also like to thank my family for their patience and understanding when I do bring work home, um, for helping me to get crafts together, cuttings, gluing, all the necessary tasks that are needed to make sure our day runs smoothly. And I couldn't do what I do without my uh, Miss, Mrs. Parks, the homeroom teacher that I work with on a daily basis. She has taught me what it is to be a great teacher. Um, she is very understanding. She, uh, I go to her for 
advice and she's always very willing and able to help without, um, <laughs> without being frustrated with the multiple questions that I ask on a weekly basis. So um, thank you for this recognition. I, I genuinely appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It's well deserved. Congratulations again. All right, our last recipient of the evening, our next exemplary employee is Ms. Jordan Combs. She's a special education teacher from William A. Diggs Elementary School, and she'll be represented by her principal, Deborah Calvert. Good afternoon again. I am very pleased to introduce you to our exemplary employee, Ms. Jordan Combs. Ms. Combs is an outstanding educator, an extraordinary colleague, and a valued team member who works tirelessly to meet the needs of all her special <coughs> education students. She is a graduate of Towson University where she received her Bachelor of Science degree in special education, and she holds a master's degree in instructional teaching and learning from Wilmington University. She came to Charles County via Cecil County and became a hawk in 2017. Ms. Combs knew from a very young age that she wanted to be a teacher. She credits her family and her third grade teacher for inspiring her love of education. She says that she remembers the warmth of Miss Moore's classroom and the way that she made her feel every day. The classroom was warm and inviting and students were so engaged that they didn't even realize how much they were learning. It's easy to see that Ms. Combs wanted to follow in her third grade teacher's footsteps. Anyone who spends time with Ms. Combs can easily see that relationships are the cornerstone of the success in her classroom. Ms. Combs strives to build a strong rapport with all of her students, as well as their families, in order to build strong school community connections. This allows Ms. Combs to have an in-depth understanding of her students and how best to reach them. As a special educator, Ms. Combs thrives in seeing her students make progress and reach milestones. She has worked with students of all ability, ability levels and says that each individual student's success helps to reignite her love for teaching. When I first met Ms. Combs, I was astounded by her energy, enthusiasm, and passion for education. She is a strong advocate for special educators, parents, and students, and is always searching for new and innovative ways to continuously improve her teaching, her department, and the school. Her efforts do not go unnoticed, as she has been the recipient of a team award from CCAC, the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and has recently earned the Think, Inspire, Grow Award from the Department of Special Education of Charles County. Ms. Combs establishes high expectations for her students, as well as herself, and works diligently to meet all of those expectations. Beyond the classroom, Ms. Combs is the special education team leader, the minority achievement representative, a captain for our Relay for Life team, and is a trainer in the county for equity and diversity. Ms. Combs readily gives up her time to participate in professional development initiatives at the school and county level and enjoys learning more about education through our professional learning communities, book studies, and other opportunities. Ms. Combs is a valuable staff member at Diggs Elementary School and most deserving of this recognition. I am proud to present to you Ms. Jordan Combs. Ms. Combs, congratulations. That's quite a long list of accolades. So thank you so much for everything you do in, in Charles County Schools. Is there anything you'd like to say? Ah, uh, yes. I actually wrote it. I don't want to forget. Um, I'm very honored to have been selected to represent William A. Diggs Elementary as exemplary employee. This is definitely one of the highlights of my teaching, to, teaching career to date. Um, I have several people that I'd like to thank that have encouraged and supported me and have played a major role in my, in my selection as an exemplary employee. 
First, I'd like to thank my mom and dad for loving, supporting, and encouraging me to pursue my passions throughout my life. I'd like to thank my sister for teaching me about patience, grace, and determination. I'd like to thank Ms. Calvert for her support and feedback and recognition for this award. I'd like to thank my amazing instructional assistant, Becky LaFontant, because without her, my job would be nearly impossible. Our instructional assistants are crucial in our schools. I'd also like to thank my IEP facilitator, Donna DePampolis, for helping me grow as a special education teacher and for always being willing to lend a helping hand. Finally, I'd like to thank all of my previous and current students. I am so grateful that they have allowed me to be a part of their lives. My kids have taught me more than they'll ever know. They've taught me determination, empathy, patience, and understanding. My students are the primary reason that I love my amazing job. Special education is and will always be a challenging and ever-changing career, but I will continue to accept the challenges and maintain high expectations for all of my students and for myself. Thank you again for this special rec recognition. It truly means so much. Thank you so much. It's always great um, when you can acknowledge the hard work of, uh, of the folks in our system. So unless there's something else, we will be on break until 6 o'clock. Thank you very much. Kyle, you can take us off. Isn't there supposed to be another major storm coming? Oh, it is. Isn't there supposed to be another major storm coming? There was talk about it this weekend. Oh. Okay. Because well, you know. I th heard it for yeah. Thursday, and then I heard them take it away. All right, good evening, folks. Uh, we're back in, se in session. Uh, this is the time uh, for public forum. Mr. Schwartz. I will read the rules for public forums. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education-related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. We have two speakers signed up. The first speaker is Melissa Carpenter. Good evening. My name is Melissa Carpenter, and I am a lifelong resident of Charles County, a graduate of CCPS, as well as a teacher here. I am once again here to share from the viewpoint of a teacher. I want to take a second to thank Dr. Navarro for recognizing the need for planning time and making a few calendar adjustments. 
but it did feel a bit counterproductive when some of us saw the new attendance policy, putting a lot more work on the teachers and the school staff. I hope you all enjoyed your breaks. Most of our educators spent it, not most, many of our educators spent it with COVID, uh, but I'm sure it wasn't from school. You know, when so many of our cases came in that it was hard to contact trace or uh, half our classes were missing those last few days due to quarantine or positives. But right before we returned, our amazing educators got bombarded about an urgent need to go virtual. We planned for it, expecting the testing to be implemented and the safety of our students and staff to count. But with numbers increasing and test kits delayed, we still returned to in-person learning yesterday. I've heard the phrase, in-person learning must not be disrupted. And I am here to tell you that without a single school closing or moving to virtual, in-person learning has been disrupted all year. What do you think happens when our positions, when we have open positions in our schools? My school has been down a fifth grade teacher since mid-September and a science teacher since October, along with many other positions. What do you think happens when we don't have enough subs to cover classrooms so rooms have to combine last minute? Although I'm incredibly thankful for the staff at Starkey for coming out, how long is that gonna last? Are we monitoring the percentage of staff out at our schools? What do you think happens when five to 10 students are missing in person because they're quarantined or positive? Or when those students return and teachers have to teach them because we are more than just worksheets and posting assignments on LMS pages. What do you think happens when we take our ins instructional assistants and have them substitute? No intervention groups, no special ed support, no kindergarten support, no pre-K support. What do you think happens when our administration covers for teachers when last minute positives or quarantines pop up or our non-school age children have daycare -ish, daycares closing? What do you think's happening in our schools? Please don't fool yourselves. In-person learning has been disrupted all year long. It's interesting we rushed back to in-person learning at the same time testing windows were happening and not COVID testing, MISA testing, iReady testing, ESOL testing. Makes you wonder, did we move to in-person because it was best for our students right now or because we have to check boxes and meet requirements? Virtual learning is not ideal. It is more work for educators to convert materials, more difficult to teach students and more technology issues. But is in-person learning with all the disruptions and absences really working? Is it what's best for our students? With more absences for teachers and students coming now that the test kits are finally out and probably resignations following the increased workload, when will we start having an open and honest conversations with the people and staff in our schools? Because this living day to day and trying to make it to June mentality is not working. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is not here, so that's the end of the public forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwartz. Next on the agenda is action items. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve the minutes from the December 14th board meeting. Second. Made by Ms. Abel, seconded by Ms. Wilson. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Battle Lockhart? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Motion approved. Next is, or it was two minutes, right? There was several sets of minutes. Executive uh, no. session for January, yes. I mean, yes. December 14th, 2021. Yes. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Sable, seconded by Ms. Wilson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, say, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Abstain. Abstain, Mr. Hurd. Ms. Battle Lockhart, did you hear that? No, sorry. Sorry, we that was the vote on the minutes from December 14th, 2021. Executive session. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Motion right. to approve the minutes from the January 3rd meeting of 20 2022. Sorry. <laughs> Second. It's made by Ms. Abel, seconded uh, by Ms. Brown. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. 
That vote is unanimous. Ms. Battle Lockhart? Yes. Yes, yes thank sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Motion to approve personnel. Second. Motion made by Ms. Sable, seconded by Ms. Brown. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. And that's <laughs> unanimous among voting members. Thank you very much. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> we'll give Mr. Uh, He's trying to catch me. <laughs> whoever was down here, who was that? <laughs> that was Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd and seconded by Ms. Sable. All those in favor? Aye. That is unanimous. Ms. Battle Lockhart, you want to stay on the line? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you all very much. Meeting is adjourned. Kyle, you can take us off, good please. Good night, Ms. Battle Lockhart. Yeah. Good night, Tosh. Good night, guys. Take care.